Uh, but in this, you know, in this world, being you know, chronically fat is not a great thing. But some people are really tuned to be fat, and it was protective. But it, not in this world so much. It could be. So the same thing with the with the violence. This way to look at it. So no, you're not born a killer. You're not born a psychopath. But you're born with genetically determined traits that are already there. And if you, those traits in particular line up with any of these psychiatric disorders, and then you're abused. This is the trouble. Then you have that's when it's that's when it's made. So it's usually made the first two years of life. Welcome to the Emil Barna podcast, where today I'll be joined by Dr. James Fallon, the author of this book, The Psychopath Inside, a neuroscientist's personal journey into the dark side of the brain. James Fallon is a professor of psychiatry and human behavior at the University of California, Irvine, and he is the emeritus professor in the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology. He's a subject matter expert at the Pentagon in the field of cognitions and war, a vice chair in the American Land Forces Institute, and a founding member of the Vatican Arts and Technology Council. He also uh, advises around uh, military dictatorships, Uh, and so much more besides. He's also appeared on the show Criminal Minds, where he gives a bit of a rundown on the human brain in psychopathy. He's uh, published two personal books, Virga Tears, a true story of a soldier's sojourn back to Vietnam, as well as The Psychopath Inside, which is going to make up uh, the discussion that we'll be talking about today. And today he was really generous with his time. We spent over two hours just chatting about things uh, all the way from psychopathy, sociopathy, uh, narcissism. We even went into child behavior and how to uh, consider psychopathic traits in, in both kids and adults, uh, how that relates to today in the social media world. And we spoke uh, even to the point of dictatorships and uh, history. We uh, surveyed current affairs matters like Black Lives Matter as an Antifa. Uh, we talk about the far left, the far right. We talk about libertarianism and uh, political engagement in some ways. We talked about the lockdown briefly and uh, the lockdowns that are happening around the world. He uh, is he identifies as a borderline psychopath, so he has many many of the positive traits of psychopathy, uh, but he is on the borderline. So he doesn't fully uh doesn't fully cross over based on the uh, inventories the psychological inventories that are available today uh, any we speak a little bit about that brace yourself we'll get right on into it thank you so much for joining me today uh, james uh, jim <laughs> as i've been told before but um yeah no it's it's really exciting to to actually sit down with you because we set this up just a couple of weeks ago and you told me earlier that you've just come off your um, wedding anniversary. So I do appreciate uh, you coming off the back of that. And uh, congratulations uh, for another year done. So <laughs> um, I had a, my wedding anniversary, but I also have uh, who happened to be out here from Boston, who I hadn't seen was my college roommate for my junior and senior year. Oh, wow. And he was here with his wife at, at the, the same day. So it's some kids down and, you know, and other people and he was here so he, he was kind of surprised it was our wedding anniversary but who cares i mean both of us uh, had very kind of parallel careers interestingly but he was a real rock star you know he was the rock star in our in our state in our city when we were when we were uh in in college and had these all these wild experiences of course that everybody I, a lot of people did in the late 60s right and and uh so and we're trying to figure out what happened when what did we do was that 66 or 69 we did what you know it's like it, lining it all up um was interesting last night You're trying to separate out what really happened because a lot of you know it was fairly crazy then right it really was i mean the things that were accepted then uh now would be you know so outrageous and so but then it was like oh yeah this is just a blast and it's so interesting, isn't it? Because uh, even though you guys would have experienced the same thing, you experience it in different ways as well. So you remember different elements of it. Is that is that right to say? I, well, I would say that I had a, I have a fairly good memory. I mean, I even have my 
my brothers and people I grew up with will call me up to ask me about to remember their experiences, you know, back a long time ago. And and I have a really good memory of these things. And I didn't, you know, I've always been a, a like a drinker, I guess. And I what I didn't. All the people I knew were all there dropping ass and they're stoned all. You know, it was really. Uh, pandemic in, in that sense then but I didn't do that I was like a drinker and if you you find it uh, years later the people who were drinkers tend to remember things uh, whereas the you know the people who were you know stoned a lot not that he was he's as straight as can be but you know and so in in matching it up with different friends from that era they'll just say I have no idea what's going on and they really mean it and and uh, but some of the people remember, of course, like you're saying, different details of the same episode. But when we both remember the same thing, we remember the exact same thing, you know. So yeah, really. And uh, so that was that was that was good to know, you know, even though there may have been other emphases on it. But do we, you know, it was either one of us didn't remember at all. Uh, but when we did remember, it was very similar. There weren't any, there wasn't much conflict in the actual base truth, if you will, of the stories. Mm. And, and I'm sure we'll get back to some of the experiences that you had in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you detail some of them in your book, um, I, The Psychopath Inside. I always get the name confused, a psychopath within or the psychopath inside, but I have to go back and I have to make sure that, that I'm, I'm well, starting. Every it. iteration was came up, you know, uh, we came up with, you know, with the publisher, the actual the publisher, but my agent and the editor, the previous book they had just done was the one about Obama. Mm -hmm. And that editor, that copy editor made the mistake of putting in the book uh, that he was born in Kenya. And she was the one. So when she, when she got to my book, which was the next book, I think, and, and they were extremely careful. So they wanted to make sure because you say you're doing a, doing a book about a psychopath and psychopaths do anything. They lie all the time. And uh, so why would we believe anything you're saying? So I, you know, they wanted, they wanted to, to talk to all this, the psychiatrists who had, who had, you know, who studied, who had studied me and who had analyzed me and the psychoanalysts, but they wanted everything proven. And it was, it was a crack up. So it was just so extremely careful. But when I came back to the book cover, it, one of the one was the psychopath within, just like you're saying, <laughs> in, as better inside. So, uh, and, and I had all sorts of ways that I wanted it to look, but I, I like the way that, what they did there. It's very clever. I, I think it's, it makes for a very good read. And it's, it's something that anybody can, can pick up because you don't you don't go to i mean too much in you know, the i mean you do you do investigate the brain science around uh, you know, psychopathy and uh, people who score highly on hairs uh, psychopathy tests and that sort of stuff what's the difference in in the brain but you make it you, you detail it in such a way that it, it makes sense and like, quite frankly it does make sense and i've highlighted a lot of stuff in this book and um, I bring it to my own clinical practice because I think there are so many parallels that I can draw from. Uh, and I'd like to ask you about a lot of those, those things in today's interview. Sure. But for, for those of yeah, you a lot of the, we had a lot of, we had a lot of um, argument about what to put in. And I had many, many other pages that never made the final cut. And it got to the point where I said, let's put in an, an appendix where I can really go into the details of the genetics, of the imaging, of the connectomes, of the connections, and and all of the variant behaviors and everything. I said because to weave the story, uh, you, we, we couldn't put it you know in at the same time. It, would, it breaks up the story terribly if you get to go into the detail. But I still wanted to have it there so people could re refer to the actual kind of deeper science of it, if you will. And, and, and they said, no, it's going to be clean. And, and so it was frustrating because I had 80 to 100 pages that never made in the final cut. So, um, but that's, that's what an agent and a publisher are for. Um, it, it actually, Don't ruin your good time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have your own ideas and, I, and it becomes your baby, doesn't it? When you, when you write something so, so in-depth and you want to really, really investigate and Put, put to the fore hey this is this is what i've come to know it was published back in 2013 so i just wonder uh 
is there a sequel coming about or are you interested in laying out all the things you were miss you miss well the, you know with some of the things other than the technical uh, parts that they asked me to take leave out well the the real science and the, and the imaging and all and the connections with neuroanatomy and how it correlated with each trait and everything so that was uh, pulled out but i had a whole other besides that about 80 pages on the temporal lobe wow and because i was you know i started by separating out by lobes and how these differ are the same in different uh, sorts of uh, not only disorders, but, you know, cluster B, just personality disorders. And so I had one on the temporal lobe with all its weirdness. And they said, we cannot publish this. They're just going to think you're so crazy. It had stuff in there. They said, no, he says, they said, it'll ruin the rest of it. They're going to go, there's no way that this is true on top of that. And so I had to take out what the people who know me best, some of the physicians who know me best, some of the psychologists and psychiatrists, they said they took the best part out of the book. And I saw so I went, you know, so they said, look, you can write two more books, put it in the next book, you know, have it because it's so, it was so, uh, the things that there were very odd, but quite true. Okay. And it wasn't about being so much a psychopath, but all the perceptual anomalies, uh, that, you know, I've had over, you know, since I was probably two or three, it was a more complete coverage. And I talk, you know, normatively what, how this, uh, the, the temporal lobe develops and co-develops with the other areas of the brain to kind of adjudicate sense of morality. But beyond that, those things that the temporal lobe do, which have nothing to do with morality, it's and it have to do with other things, hallucinations, you know, hallucinations and, and all sorts of divinations and weird, really weird stuff. And they said, it's just too strange. So they said, you can put it into a next book. Of course, that was followed up by my wife going, you know, you write another book, well, that's definitely divorce time. So, you know, you're always, you know, she was kind of brave, I would say, and sort of my kids and grandkids would go along with this uh, because it's not, it's not completely pretty. And, and so, yeah, there were, there were parts left out and um, so I don't know if I'm going to, you know, add those in because it's got to be with the context of another whole story, right? A narrative. And I, it's got to be all true, but that doesn't mean it's not weird. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, that's, that was, that was a long fight and I had to rewrite a lot of it. You know, I wrote that, uh, uh, the first part I wrote this, sketched it in South Africa on a, on the, the garden road down in Nisna. And then when I finally wrote it, I had, when we got, we agreed on the structure, then I went to another friend's place, a psychiatrist actually in Northern Italy into this 500 year old house where there was nobody that spoke English. And I was there uh, for several months, just writing it. And, uh, and, and so that the whole thing about putting together different parts, it was done in different places in the, in the, in the world, actually. Uh, to give you know each thing would be a kind of a reset of the environment so I could restart uh, but given the same structure okay it's, it, it, and so it just puts you in a different environment and loosens it up a little bit but I had loosened up so much by the time I had written it there they said no, so I'll rewrite so I had to rewrite everything that's painful oh gosh I, I don't know this is a little that's a little too creative, they said. It's too creative. I said, it's all true. She goes, yeah, it's true. I know it's, you know, because we've, we've had you vetted. And they brought people on to vet me. And that was, I wasn't insulted at all because they had to do this because by its very nature, you know, a psychopath, if anything, a con man who will say anything. Right? Well, actually, I, I would love to pick your brain uh, on that if, you, if you're willing to indulge me. Uh, well, we'll see. Okay, sure. We'll see how we go. Um, I'll tell you what, Jim, uh, for those who might not be familiar with your work, might not be familiar with you, do you mind giving a brief sketch uh, about where you're at and where you've come from and where you're at now? Uh, anything you'd like to include? Yeah, there's, you know, the, you know, if you, if you look at my life, it's a quite normal type of, um, you know, on one level, certainly, if you look at it. Because, uh, you know, where I am right now, I'm in, you know, living faculty housing in the faculty ghetto here at University of California, Irvine. That's where I'm sitting in my office in the house that's on the university property. 
And I've been a professor at the University of California, Irvine since 1978. And I was in the University of California, UCSD for a long postdoc, the pediatric neurologist before that, 75 to 78. And so, and I have the same job and I have a successful career and uh, it, it had, you look at my patents, you look at my papers and, and, and that the body of work, it's, it's varied, you know, and, and it's, it's all over the place, actually, you know, it would be one, it, it, here's the one part about it, even though there's a consistent career, et cetera, and, and productivity and a normal thing, and I, you know, and, and without any trouble, you know what I mean? It's just, and had a, it had, have had a wonderful time doing this whole gig, right? From the time from 1975, actually before that, I was, got a degree in psychology at, uh, in, psych, in psychophysics in Rensselaer Polytechnic. Rensselaer Polytechnic, it's 1972 to 75. And then before that, I was, um, so, you know, then I was at St. Michael's College in Vermont in biology, chemistry. And so if you look at that, when I, from when I remember, I always wanted to be like something about biology and medicine. It was just obvious that I wanted to do this. It was very natural. And, and so uh, I never really had to plan anything. It was just naturally always there. I never had, a, what am I going to do with my life? And it, it, it was never there. And, you know, the first girl I dated, she was 12 years old. And, and I was 12 at the same time. And, and I'm still, and I'm married to her. You know, we were our first dates and then we became friends. And then we started making out at our house spontaneously one day when we were on our 16th birthday. And we've been together ever since. And we have like th three kids, five grandkids, probably another, and a, probably a great grandkid coming. And so if you look at that, this does not look like the life of a psychopath or somebody with a lot of, you know, or criminal at all, because it's very consistent. I always knew the girl I loved, you know, and I, and I, and I live with her now. We have a great time together. And, and, and so this does not look like the picture of somebody who's got a psychiatric disorder and certainly not psychopathy or any of the cluster Bs. And, and so there's that sort of um, on the face of it, a very a, a normal life. And then you live these parallel lives too, you know, and, and it was my, my, my mother was kind of helpful in this, uh, when I was writing the book and afterwards, she, she died at 102 a couple of years ago. So, and once we, I started giving talks about this, she, she opened up, uh, you know, about this, what we consider a normal life. She said, we were quite worried about you. You're, you're a pretty strange guy. And, you know, especially going through puberty, right before puberty, during puberty, uh, it was kind of a dark person in the sense of I would, you know, withdraw um, and like spend a whole summer just rebuilding a boat, a speedboat or something and not talking to people. And, and she said, when you go to school and come back, even when you were very young, you would clean everything, you'd pick up everything on the way. And because I did have clinical OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and I knew it was crazy. So I wasn't OCPD, you know, but I, and I knew these were crazy thoughts and obsessions and couldn't really control them then. Uh, but they were there and then they, they let, uh, they let up. Uh, I still have some OCD, but it's very useful because I get things done. You know, I, I and I keep notes, a careful notes, because, you know, any, any kind of disorder, if you will, has traits that are wonderful for success. I mean, and so I've looked at it, you know, that way, but certainly my mother said, you know, would say we were worried and, and she, at the time, I didn't even know it, uh, may, told my teachers, cause she had, she was a teacher. Um, and, and my aunts were teachers too. And, and they're all really smart uh, on both sides. And, and my uncles were, they were and my grandparents, and my parents. So they were really a fantastic uh, family to grow up in. Uh, and, and so they knew someone was wrong. So my mother told my teachers, make sure to keep him busy all the time. Make sure he's in, you know, cause he likes to do a bunch of things to so make sure he's, he's at it. Uh, and he's very physical and, and, and can be aggressive. So I, you know, I went into wrestling. Uh, I went into downhill skiing. I raced downhill skiing from the time I was 12 until all through college and a little afterwards. I was in tackle football, collegiate and high school football, a lot of banging around, you know, uh, but also, in, you know, playing instruments and being in the student government, 
uh, being an acting with play. And I was constantly busy, but they would always encourage this because they said, you know, like my mother had said, once he's, once he stops doing that, he's, he could, I think he could be a very dangerous person. So that I didn't know about until, you know, a few years ago. It, it was after I had written the book and, and then she started opening up about things and, the, and, you know, more about the background in her family, we found out, not on her side. Those are all the Goombas. All the Sicilians are, you know, they were actually the academics and they were the ones who were very well behaved. And, uh, but on the English side, you know, they, the other side, there were some real hombres, man. And we just find more and more of them and just really dangerous characters, murderers and scoundrels like you can't believe. So, um, but, you know, if you, if you look at those things, the overt things in my life, you know, with a checklist, you'd say, well, this is a normal kid. He never, he's never had a breakdown or anything, but he could be strange and intense. And, but, and I've been, because, you know, I've been a professor in psychology, psychiatry, I've been tested a lot over the years because, you know, you're all the people, you know, they're, they want to test you, right. It, it, you know, and all the, the psychoanalysts want to test. So I have been tested a lot, but I was never really tested for what was specifically, you know, a cluster B problem. Uh, and you really have to know, as you know, as a, as a psychotherapist, psychoanalyst to, you have to really know these things very well to do it. Not many people have that knowledge. So that kind of slipped through. It never, you know, came up until it was specifically tested for. And so at any rate, you, uh, uh, the people I grew, who grew up around me would say I was the really nice guy, I had the nicest guy in the world and all this stuff. And, and I was a lot of friends. People always wanted to hang around with me and be my friend, right? And be friends with and, 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 and do things with. Uh, but there was always, from the time I was about 10, an adult every year or two, a priest, could be a rabbi, a teacher, a local doctor, you know, in the neighborhood who knew me. We had, we had <laughs> two of the people that I, where I grew up, Lonville, New York. One guy was the mastermind of MK Ultra, all the L LSD experiments, you know, for the CIA. He ran that. And the guy that lived across the street was a, was a, was a psych psychotherapist and a psychiatrist used a lot of electroshock therapy and drugs so they've got to have two guys on my street you know who are mk ultra guys but some of them would say things some of the physicians on the street that said there's something very dark and not good about you and they were never specific that was just the way i looked at them or something or because i had like we would say a leadership skills and that, as it went on i would i would i would get into mischief that was great fun for everybody and i would you know we never really anything bad happened, but real, real mischief. And I was one of the ringleaders, but it was just, you know, fun. But it, it, it occurs to this day from rabbis, psychiatrists, teachers, certainly professors through, through college and afterwards. And so there's something very dark about you. They couldn't put their finger on it, but it's always, that's been a very consistent thing. In addition to this, the greatest guy, and a really nice guy. And um, so th that's a little bit in conflict. I, I think there's, there's probably a lot of people have this, you know, I, I, if you look at me with, I have no criminal record or anything like that. I have a perfect credit score. I've always had, and, but probably that could have a lot to do with my wife too. Right. And having kids and everything and saying, okay, because I don't think even anybody with a problem like that wants to go to jail or wants to be caught or wants to do those things and have, have themselves caught. So it's not like it's a complete blessing. But, you know, objectively, certainly, I, I look like I've had a, a very good, clean, but successful uh, life. So, so nothing's, you know, there's nothing jumps out. So that would be the, the, I think, those two narratives that would be true, which wouldn't signal much at all, but except for the couple of, the couple of caveats I mentioned. At what point did you kind of, ex or come to know that, hey, psychopathy might be part of my story uh do you want to do you want to walk our listeners yeah i mean what sure there's complete surprise uh, absolute surprise and you know we had spent a lot of time from about 1997 until today but there was a whole stretch there where we we uh formed a consortium around the country of psychiatry it's biological psychiatry where we're saying how do we put together genetics you know allelic data with imaging data 
How do we merge those with the clinical data and come up with a way to directly and quickly diagnose people based on the interaction of the imaging and the, and the genetics? And that occurred from about, which is personalized medicine, it's personalized psychiatry, and it really worked. We had patents on it, and it was, and and so it really went bang. And so we did that from the late '90s through, and, and a lot of a lot of the people are retired and gone now, but certainly up through 2015. But I'm still working and publishing with uh, with two, with three of them, and we're doing the same thing. We and it's become more. Uh, intensive because now we look a lot at transposons, transposable elements, and in, you know, some of the epigenetic markers. So it's, but it's the same sort of idea of creating mathematical statistical models of being able to zoom right in immediately. If somebody, if they're depressed, if they have uh, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, doing a lot of work on schizophrenia. And, uh, but at the same time, in parallel, very minor thing, not even tertiary, quaternary part of my, my work, this started in 1989. We got a really good PET scanner in, in the Department of Psychiatry here. And we had one of the, there's only six or seven in the world that had the resolution. It was an HRRT plus PET scanner with wonderful, uh, you know, resolution where you could really break down. Uh, this is, was a neuroanatomist dream. I'm a neuroanatomist at heart. And, and where you could see subsectors of the insula, subsectors of the amygdala, sub, you know, like real, uh, real microscopy almost. And so, so we we're taking these techniques and we had uh, uh, one of the clinical trials we were going through was on Alzheimer's disease. And we were looking, there was like, a, a, there were some alleles missing. It was the APOE, but it didn't account for all that much of the variance. There's some, there was some other epistatic interaction that is, you know, gene gene interaction somehow. And we were kind of looking for that other gene. So we did a clinical trial. And, and at the end of that, we, we had all the patients, but not enough of the control. So we really wanted to get this done. So I said, look at, Hey, I'll, I'll do it. I'll get my family to do it. I said, my my wife, I'll have to ask her because her whole family, she's got a lot of Alzheimer's in her family. So that would be scary for her uh, to find out something like that. But she was, she was funny about it because she had just had massive uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma tumors in 2000, 2001, 2002, but it was treated. It never came back. It was great. So her attitude was like, I'm going to die of lymphoma and cancer before I die of Alzheimer's. So who gives a shit? You know, she's like, that's how she is. And, and so we went and did it, you know, and did some of our you know, kids, we did, you know, some of my brothers, myself, her. And so we did the PET scans, we did the genetics, we did the psychometrics, and then the, the data came back. But the data came back at the, the same month that I had finished analyzing a whole bunch of, uh, scans, somewhere fMRI, uh, spec scans, PET scans from different clinics around the country. And so, and, you know, because I had been looking at serial killers from about 1989, but it was like one at a time, one every year or something, uh, you know, some of these high profile people and, do, and looking at the analysis of what in the scans, not the genetics, but what's in the, you know, the functional brain scans. And so, but at the end of that, I got a whole load of uh, of these. And so I analyzed it and, and lo and behold, and nobody had ever really come up with a full comprehensive sort of view of what would be the psychopath pattern, not what's the pattern of a murderer or killer, what's the psychopath pattern. And so I analyzed those and they fit in really neat groups of, there was a whole group that was their impulsive murderers. Then there was a disorganized ones that had brain damage, get hit in the head with a hammer, a lot of drugs, but then there were these other cases that were uh, clearly different. And I did this blindly because I don't, you know, I, a lot of times when you're doing work, forensic work uh, and in, in, in legal work like we were doing, you know up front who the person is. And this is no way to do science, right? Because everybody, want, every, everybody, most honest person, scientists will want to make a story. Oh, this is the psychopath. There must be something there, you know but I didn't know anything, but they fell in these really neat patterns. So I had a pile of the, the final pile of those on my desk uh, in the office at that time, this is 2005, and had, was starting to give talks. 
um, uh, to vet the idea because this was something new, right? And and I was giving it to psychology, psychiatry department, CogSci, uh, law schools, all you know, and in, 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 in different forensic groups to vet it out at that time. So I've got those there, and now the two technicians come into my office with this different set of scans having to do with Alzheimer's, had nothing to do with psychopathy. Uh, even though we used the tasks on the PET scans uh, and on the fMRI, that would evince emotional empathy, would event, you know, it was, it was part of that package. So it wasn't just for uh, Alzheimer's and schizophrenia, it was broadly for different types of attention and include, included empathy type of thing. So it was useful that way, it was more com comprehensive. So when I looked through these, I went through the pile of my family scans and you know, they're, they're color coded because you use the flame, you know, everybody's seen the flame. You know, red means that that area of the brain is hotter than a normal person or hotter under a drug condition. And the blue are really cold lower areas. And so you have the flame scale. So I quickly went through, cause I've seen so many of these scans for all sorts of disorders, right? Uh, over the years. and. And I looked through when I got through the almost the entire pile and it, they looked grossly normal. I was really happy about this. None of them looked like there was any problem uh, and, and certainly not an Alzheimer's problem because we had, uh, I, I created, a, you know, with a, with a machine learning guy, a way to analyze and diagnose with, you know, just with a computer when it was like 98%. So I had to teach the computer. So I knew all the little angles and everything. Uh, with this, but it going through and it was great. I said, my God, my wife, probably my wife, I didn't know the names of the people, but all of them were fine. I got to the last, uh, you know, scan at the bottom of the pile. And I, and I looked at it and I, I said, and I looked up at the detectives. And I said, okay, it's really funny. All right. You slipped in one of the murderers, right? I said, because this, whoever this cat is, this is, should not be walking around in, in open society because uh, it was so pathological and it didn't have any other problems, but it had no activity in the ventral medial and orbital cortex, you know, at the base of the frontal lobe, nothing in the anterior medial temporal lobe. The, the amygdala was kind of a speckled hot and cold the anterior insula had a weird pattern for, you know, the type of empathy that's, that you would find in somebody with psychopathy. Now it's not people of that pattern have psychopathy, but that's the trait, you know, and it was consistent with that. So I said, I just laugh and I said, guys, this is very funny. Okay. They go, no, no, this is really one of your family. I said, you got to be kidding. And so that's when I had to pull the tape off to see what it was. And of course, that's when Gandalf showed up at my door and it was me. I was it. And uh, so that's, that's when the, the shit hit the fan a bit. Wow. Um... I could imagine <laughs> sifting through so so many scans and you know this is what you do for a living and then you come across one at the end and you find out it's you it's it's a yeah. way, it's a whole you know, punch in the face uh, I would say given your knowledge about psychopathy up until oh, that point well when I saw it I just laughed you know I, I just laughed and and I said well my theory must be wrong obviously because I'm okay you know I'm a perfectly normal person this can't be the right pattern. So as a scientist, I just said, I, you know, it's not that I have psychopathy, it's that this pattern that I discovered was not the right one because it couldn't be me. That's, that was my response. And I kind of blew it off. And when the genetics came back a while later and it was the same thing, you know, with my family and I had all these alleles of different, especially the monoamines like serotonin, dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, uh, but also oxytocin, vasopressin, and different, you know, alleles associated with different kinds of empathy and aggression and violence. And I had them all. So it was, it was just like that. But I still, when I saw it, when I broke the code on the genetics, I still kind of just didn't care or just laughed it off. I really did. I was like, and, and I mean, and two things I went, two curious things I would say happened when I, when the, the, some of the psychiatrists I work with, right, and who and who know me and, and looked at this, they said, this is really pathological. I said, what do you think about that? I said, I don't give a shit. And one of them said, that's your problem. You really don't care. And I, and I didn't, I don't. 
But the same week, at the end of that week, I went back and I mentioned it to my wife. I said, Dave, her name is Diane. I said, you know, uh, I had the weirdest kind of odd experience here. I went through these scans and everything's we're all normal. Your brain looks normal. It's great. No, no Alzheimer's problem, probably from, you know, the data we had. I said, but my, my, my PET scan was completely pathological. I said, I looked like the worst of any, the murderers I had seen who were psychopaths. And she said something really with a straight face. She goes, it doesn't surprise me. That, that was, you know, that was a curious thing because I've known her forever. I know when she's kidding and not kidding, she was not kidding, but I still blew it off. I just, I just, and then went on. And we were really busy working on a bunch of grants and patents and papers. So I didn't have time to even slow down. You know, it's a, and, you know, I'm following the first rule, I guess, of cartoon making. You know, Wiley E. Coyote, he runs off the edge of that cliff after the Roadrunner. Uh, he doesn't fall down unless he looks down, <laughs> then he will fall. And so he never looked down, right? So it was, I guess, following that. So I just really, it never really bothered me at all. And, and it wasn't until later when I, had, after I, some years later, uh, well, a couple of years later, and I was asked to give a TED talk on something and I was starting I wanted to talk about stem cells adult stem cells in the brain they said hey, you have something better and I said well, I had this screwy thing happen I told them this story and they go that's it I go who the hell wants to hear that story they go they want to hear it to, to me it wasn't interesting it wasn't you know it was because I didn't really take it seriously or anything so I gave that talk and a tremendous response and that was followed up by I was asked to give a talk in in Norway at the University of Oslo uh, because the former prime minister at that time, uh, in his first term, he found out he had bipolar disorder. And you know, for a European, especially like a Scandinavian, Northern European, to admit that they have a psychiatric disorder, their first term or any time, I thought was just wild. I said, this guy, this guy, you talk about heroic. So yeah, I went and I flew over and he gave his personal story about how he got treated. And he went on to have two full successful terms, two four-year terms as prime minister, real success story, just especially for Europeans who didn't want to admit ever that they had anything psychiatrically wrong ever in public. Would be. So he really helped out. And, and, and I gave, uh, I, I gave the, the method. It was a public talk with a lot of scientists, psychiatrists there at the, at the talk at the University of Oslo. And I had to use somebody's data and I couldn't use other people's data. So I had to use mine to describe how we do to the technique to do personalized psychiatric medicine uh, with the genes in, you know, and the, the, the imaging and, and the, the, the traits and everything. And at the end of that talk, the, uh, the guy stood up in the back of the room and, he, and he, he was the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Oslo. And he goes, oh, thanks, that was, that was great and everything else. So there's just two things, first of all, you, he said, because I showed all of my traits, all of my genetics, all of what, the development of my life and every little thing I had, all the phenotypes. And he goes, you don't really wouldn't call this in the United, in the United States, but by the ICD and European standards, you, you're, you have bipolar disorder. He says, the problem thing is with you, you're never down. You're, it's always up. So, you know, and we know, of course, that, you know, bipolar disorder is not defined by the depression. It's defined by the mania or hypomania. And I've always had been hypomanic. So it fits with that. And hypomanics, I just love being hypoman hypomanic and because it feels so good. And I can't imagine anybody would want to be treated for hypomania. It's like you're always on top of the world, but not like manic. It's not a full out layout. It's not psychotic, but you just feel great, you know, and you feel, and you're very productive and all that stuff. And, and so he goes, there's that. And, and also we want to talk to you afterwards. So afterwards we went to the president of the university of of Oslo's house, downtown Oslo, and, uh, and there were a whole bunch of people there, and they had all this, the physicians, you know, the psychiatrists and psychologists were at the talk, and I, start, you know, we started having drinks together, and they spent a few hours with me, and they said, after talking to you, so there's, a, there's another thing here, he says, you're joking about this, but you probably are a psychopath, uh, or very close, you know, they're very close and 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 at that point that's when i started to think and then it was like that was about 2010 then i came back uh, and i was retiring at the time i still do work and i still teach but not the full gig of being a professor 
with all the teaching administration, because I was a president of the faculty at the university and the head of the faculty at the hospital and, you know, uh, in the medical school. So I had all these things in addition to, you know, like anybody does, you get old enough, you do all this stuff, right? It's nothing special. And so I had, you know, about that same year, uh, at, right at that time had, had uh, retired, but, you know, I still was working in the lab with these guys. But at any rate, I went back and started really asking people. I started with my wife and I said, tell me what you really think of me. Don't pull any punches because people won't tell you what they think of you. You know, either they're scared of you, especially if they think I'm really nuts, you know, or, or I'm a psychopath. Don't, don't poke the bear, right? It's like, but I said, no, no. And I started with her and she told me what she really thought of me and what I've done and it went over the years. And then I went to the, my kids, my brothers, and then to the psychiatrist I know. And they all say the same thing. They said, you're, you know, basically, and the clinician said, you're probably borderline. Actually, you're not a full clinical categorical psychopath, but you're right on the border. And, and, and after spending a lot of time with them and then with the psychoanalysis and, you know, the full analysis, it was the, the, the summary was that what one of them said, and the other agreed with the clinician, that here's a person who has all the urges and thoughts, dreams, everything of a full-blown psychopath. He just simply doesn't act them out. And if you don't act them out, of course, that means you're not, you don't really have it, you know, okay? Uh, and so, uh, but I had, they told me, you know, all of the, in asking everybody, they say, you do really truly psychopathic things, but you're just having fun with people. So you're always manipulating people. You're always on the, on the make, but I'm not on the make for sex or money or anything. I'm on the make just, making somebody part of my world for a while, whether it's a minute or three hours or whatever. And that's what apparently I get a buzz out of is just owning people that way, having them want to really uh, get into my world and, and be swallowed up. And that's so I, uh, after this, uh, my, I kept asking my wife, tell me when I'm starting to do this. And she'll tell me, she'll give me the, you know, the, the sign because I'll be at a bar and be surrounded by chicks and all this stuff, which, and she's not jealous because I don't do anything. You know what I mean? But it's always like this telling stories and all the stories are true. And I told her that I said, I, you know, at a party and, 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 and she goes, I know they're all true, but you're, you, you're manipulating these people. You're using them. You're, you know, you're having them buy your whole thing. And, and this is, this is a big buzz for you. And, it, and that bothered her. It wasn't of who it was, because she's just never would be. She's not a jealous or envious person at all. And but she said, that's annoying because I know what you're doing. You're, you're, you're already having the greatest time just building, creating this world that they're all sucking into with these true stories. So I so I try to, uh, you know, I, I'm narcissistic enough not to ever have to resort to lying. I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm, you know, with all the psychopathy, I really go out of my way never to lie. And and. Uh, now, of course, if somebody asks me something directly, I don't, I have, you know, and this is something my wife taught me, and she's like a really well-behaved person. She goes, Jim, when somebody asks you, you know, do you masturbate, do you masturbate uh, twice a day or say, you know, something crazy, you know, something like that. She says, you don't have to answer them. It's not lying if you say, you know, mind your goddamn business or no, that's not a lie because they're intruding in on you. And I grew up always thinking you have to tell the, complete truth, complete truth, even if it's none of anybody's business. So she really helped me do that because I was really, as part of the obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and the type I had was scrupulousness, right? Re religiosity, and I had to be perfect. I had to be perfect. And that involved never, ever saying anything that was false or anything. So, you know, kind of carried that uh, along, even though the OCD and it's, and it's floored, uh, uh, you know, and not terrible. I'm not, you know, a lot of people really suffer. I don't think I was suffering. Some of the stuff was really <laughs> bothersome. But, um, and so, and she said that makes it worse because you're not lying at all. You're telling the truth, but you're still manipulating the hell out of people, all this kind of thing. But then there are these other uh, sorts of uh, uh, traits that would fit into this, this idea of non-planfulness, you know? The idea in, in psychopathy, which I love. And so even though I have all this order in my, my life, I, I like to use the order so I can become completely chaotic 
and have a great time. So you set up the party, man. It's setting up the party in your life. So I, I'm not like a scatter and he's very irresponsible, but I, I set it up. So, okay, okay, we have now set up this thing. Now we can have the chaos and that's where the fun is. So, but it's a kind of, yeah, go ahead. Use order uh, to create chaos in a sense. Oh yeah, no, it's like the evil empire in, your, in, your, in yourself. That's what it's all about, right? This is Antifa 101. And, but on a personal basis, you know, uh, you know, it's not, you know, because people usually think uh, there's all this chaos and we have to create order out of it. And of course, if you're, if you're, if you're like an Antifa type of person or a real heart, you know, like a Maoist or something, the whole idea is to take order and create chaos, mm. right? And so therefore, but it's that, it's sort of like that if somebody, uh, and, but for me, it was all just about creating a situation we're all of us going to have the greatest time of our life. And I've always done that, even, you know, junior high, high school, and people have a great time with me, but I take them on rides, take them to places that are extremely dangerous, really dangerous. And, uh, and that they considered awful. And I, you know, in my defense, I would say, I do everything. When we walk into the woods in Africa, and it says, don't come in here, lions. And, and I, you know, I bring my son in or I go out, you know, water skiing with my kids and there's sharks in the water. I'm in there with them. And, and they let me know in no uncertain terms, this is psychopathic. Even you're playing with them. You're, and you're not doing it because you're not trying to hurt them, but you're being irresponsible. And, but for me, I would always go there, you know, like with my kids, like my son or something, we go in there, what are the chances of really dying? And I would, and I would teach, try to teach my kids how to, to assess risk. Uh, uh, against the reward and some people are completely risk averse i am not you know the first time i went to to spain i had to run with the bulls in in pamplona because you know the same thing i did on a farm when i was a kid working on a farm having these bulls chase me well i just won actually every day that was the thrill and so for me it's all thrill and calculated risk uh but it's everything so you know it turns out if you're if you're a stranger, you have nothing to worry about with me. But once you get in, if you're a friend or you're close, you're really close, or you come into this world, it's dangerous. It really is. And that's what people say. You, you just, you, you're just extremely dangerous. But I'm there. I'm with them all the way because it's, it's mostly to me about thrill seeking. Yeah, can I tease apart three things? Because uh, you did mention a couple of them. Uh, one of which was psychopathy, uh, to, to be a psychopath. And the other one was narcissism. And the third yeah. one you haven't mentioned is you know, a sociopath, a sociopathy. No, yeah. I'm just wondering whether there is a distinction in your mind between the three. And if there is, what, what is that distinction for, for a lady? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I go back to the Cleckley's original stuff from the 40s and 50s. Because Cleckley, in studying sociopathy and psychopathy, he did it in, in psychiatric patients, whereas Bob Hare did it in prisoners. And, you know, so I went back and looked at that, the, you know, that the evolution of that, the, the idea of what is a psychopath and a sociopath. And, and I liked his thing. So the thing is, you just have to define what you mean. We'll call it A and B, but I like Cleckley's. And the first is the idea of a primary psychopath, which is what we call a psychopath. And the secondary psychopath is what we call a sociopath. And these are, they may do the same exact behaviors, but the reason why is completely different. And that's the interesting thing. So the people that said, no, they're not different. You know, we use different terms. It's really the same thing. It's not. So I, you know, these are two different animals. And it's just like you would separate out a disorder, like let's say OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, from the personality disorder part. You know, if you have OCPD, mm. well, you do we have all these obsessions and compulsions, but they're very different. Somebody who is just the OCD they know that they're crazy thoughts and delusions and urges. Somebody with OCPD, the, they think it's perfectly good. Their thing is, okay, you know, I'm, this is, I'm correct, you know? And, and these are very different, even though the behaviors in the report would be very similar. And the same thing with a, a psychopath and a sociopath, going from the original Cleckley view of it. And, 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 and with that, um, it, it would be somebody who is a, a sociopath knows what they're doing is wrong and they have a sense of moral reasoning they when they're caught many times they are embarrassed humiliated 
or they do any of many sociopaths, real sociopaths will end up remorseful. And, but they also, you know, they have tell, so you can see that they have something because they're nervous about it and they feel bad about it. So even though they'll do it anyway, they know it's wrong. So they have the same sort of moral compass that a normal person would have, but they, the difference is they go ahead and do it anyway. Now, the, in the Kleckian way, the psychopath, just like the dichotomy between OCD and OCPD, if you look at OCDPD, that's the personality disorder. And, the, and, and really, the psychopathy is the per, personality disorder variant, you know? And, and so in that case, the, the true psychopaths, the primary psychopath, they, they think what they're doing is really okay. They're not embarrassed about it. That's why they're so hard to catch. They have no tells because they really, in a very deep sense, don't think what they're doing is wrong. And so they have their own moral code, if, if, but it's not of the society or subculture or culture they're in. It's very much at odds with that. And so uh, they think it's okay and completely justified. That's when you hear, you know, people who are, uh, you know, the, if you go from the 1920s, the Fry Corps, or on the streets today, you know, like I was mentioning, people like Antifa, or people who are, who think what they're doing is justified, but it's not okay for the, everybody else. See, they would, if you really believe it, that's a form of psychopathy. So if you want psychopathy, which are people that really are, that create mayhem in people or groups' lives, and they think, no, I'm justified. That's more like psychopathy. So well, you don't have to go very far to see psychopathy today. You want in the street. But there are also psych, you know, sociopaths out there too. And a sociopath um, is more like the pissed off loser, right? And this is kind of, seems to be created, not like a psychopath primary psychopath, you know, it looks like you have to have a certain fraction of alleles, the forms of genes that uh, are commensurate with those traits of psychopathy. Now, if you're not abused very early on between birth and two or three years old, usually birth to two, abandoned or abused, if you're not, you just have those traits because, you know, there's, you know, if you look at all the personality traits and then the the complex adaptive behaviors, there's hundreds of them. These are, these are fundamentally determined by genetics, but everybody has a different early experience. It's the very early experiences for psychopathy and for other personality disorders, the pernicious cluster Bs. And, and so they're where they've really been abused and they have the genes. This is the magic interaction of as everybody we know now is, which is epigenetics. The, so this is, so in that case, the brain forms differently, the myelination patterns and the, the regulators of those genes in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. That's the social brain, the social and emotional brain, limbic system. And so those regulators of the genes, whether the promoters or the insulators, these different regulators of the genes there in that part of the brain are set kind of forever in either a, a, in an abnormal up position all the time always aggressive, you know, as opposed to being aggressive when you should be aggressive. Um, and, and so that's a more permanent thing. And you can look at the brain, the connections, the myelination, the hardcore wiring is set pathologically forever. And therefore, this means that you, it, to fix a psychopath is a very low probability event, because they're, they're, they're hardcore wired. It's not like their monomines are off because monomine pathways like dopamine, serotonin, they're very plastic anyway. And, you know, most of the pharmaceutical industry is based on manipulating monomines, which are plastic. But this, these personality disorders that are set down early, those are myelinated fiber tracks there. And, and that's hardcore. And so, so, so with the psychopath and with the other, uh, you know, the other cluster Bs, those things are set early. And so empathy, emotional empathy, not cognitive empathy, emotional empathy is, is, is always in a diseased state. You know, they don't have it, like opposite of autistics. And, um, and so in, in the sense of, you know, aggression uh, for a normal person, it's perfectly fine to kill somebody. They come in to try to kill you or your, your family. Yeah, it's, murder is okay. But in that case, it's called homicide, right? It's just homicide is killing of one person by another. But, um, and so it's appropriate. But the psychopaths do inappropriate things. Now, if you look at what a sociopath is more complicated, because it looks like 
you may have somebody who really doesn't have the genetics for it, for these traits, but they're bullied when they're seven or eight or they're extremely sexual and they're always refused it. It's like the young guy who is always attracted to the first kind of, kind of gal and he, and he, and he, he ends up getting even with all women who look like that. They kill them. And, and so that is more uh, a sociopath. Mm. And so they're, they're, they seem to be more created later during the growth period after five to about 12 years old. That's when the bullying occurs, et cetera. Uh, but they, they, they have the same moral structure and moral reasoning as normal people. So in this, you know, in a very quirky, weird way, I guess, uh, a sociopath, is a much worse person. That's where the evil is. Psychopath, you can't be evil if you think what you're doing is justified. It's not evil. So psychopaths aren't evil in this sense. It's, if you said that to somebody, they're going, what are you talking about? So they're just pure predators, man. They're just pure predators. You know, is a great white shark a, a sinner? No, no, no. They're scary, you know, they're, they're really scary, but they don't have, since they're not immoral. In this sense, the psychopaths aren't immoral and the sociopaths are. And, and so this is, you know, this kind of reasonings, a lot of people might, even some clinicians, might reject this. Because first of all, it makes one group, you can't ever fix them. And there's not a clinician in the world that wants to hear that, right? I can do it, I can fix them and everything, but I've yet to see this happen. Everybody can change. You know, we have a lot of people who promise to change on January 1st every year. And it lasts for about seven days. Everybody's wonderful and they have a, they have a free will for seven days. And then they're, they're right back at, you know, hitting the sauce or hitting, hitting the pumpkin pie. And so uh, even the same with alcoholics or, you know, addicts, everybody's got this thing where I have, you know, you have free will, but only maybe for a few days or a few, a couple of months, you know? And so this is the imperative, it seems with this. So, and you, you get this with, with the psychopaths and sociopaths, they do it in cycles too, almost like in regular rhythms. But I look like, especially for a psychopath, like an addiction. And so, so these are different ways you can look at these, at least in the, you know, uh, the way you know, I do and the group I work with does, but not everybody does. Everybody's got a different angle on this. I'd love you know, to pick up, pick up on that soon. Um, and, and I'm just wondering, there, there's, a, there's an, something I heard a while back was, that every psychopath is a narcissist, but not every narcissist is a psychopath. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether you can tease apart how narcissism relates to psychopathy and how that relates to sociopathy, for example. Well, I mean, first of all, as you know, you know better than I do, that somebody, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali says he's the greatest. The thing is, he was the greatest. And so if you, and if you say I'm the most powerful man in the world or powerful woman, and it's true, it's not narcissism. You're just telling the facts. It pisses people off. Probably got so Conor McGregor people. in that one <laughs> these days. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but you have, it has to be not true. And so there are people who would say, well, he's a narcissist, but if you say, is he really the best in this? And if he is, then you're just envious that he's got this, you know, he's, he's no, he has no problem. So people throw around narcissism and, and, you know, half of it, it seems to be people who don't have the talents, right? And now they're going to mad because you've got the talents and they're going to tell everybody. Now, this is not politic, right? It may not make you a, a narcissist or having a personality disorder. You're just telling it like it is. And so you, you get, you know, politicians and CEOs and people say he's got NPD or he's got psychopathy. No, is, is, is he the wealthiest guy in the world yet? Well, he's not, this is not narcissism. He, he shouldn't say it maybe, but it's not a, so there's all that part, right? So if, the, if somebody really has the juice, if they have what they're saying, it doesn't count at all. So you can have somebody who's a, a, a psychopath who has narcissism, but not all, I don't agree with that because it's not a, a necessary trait. Narcissism is not a necessary trait of psychopathy, nor is sadism that there's nowhere in there that sadists people i think many people would assume that psychopaths you know they like pulling the wings off of you know little animals and birds and that they're sadistic and this is not true they can be but it's not diagnostic it's not really a core trait at all and that's usually disappointing because it 
you know, that many of the depictions, there's the sadistic side, but it's not necessarily true at all. And nor is the narcissism, but certainly the behavior of somebody with psychopathy and being so, you know, this, what's called in the PPI, not in the hair, but more in the, you know, psychopathic personality inventory, which people can take. Um, and in, in that, it's, which is more for normal people to see if they have psychopathic traits, right? But also for category you know, categorization, just like Levinson and some of these other tests, uh, that, th that sense of fearless dominance appears like narcissism. But it's also, you know, somebody who's very powerful. And, and, and I think just the, the term is good because fearless dominant means I'm running you guys, I'm in control here. A lot of people love that. They want that in the president. They want that in a, in a CEO. They want somebody in charge. It's going to, you know, when the Hun comes, there's somebody that's going to get the Hun for him uh, and it's going to take charge and it's very confident. And so those things that people might say is, are pathological those like nurse not narcissism but narcissistic traits they they say oh, i hate people like that but, but they'll end up voting for people who are narcissists it's very odd because this is all this has been uh you know published as you know in, in under scientific rigor by a number of groups is there's all these people say i hate psychopaths i hate narcissists but if you look at who they vote for that's exactly i mean bill clinton's a great example because he's so cute and he's just, I just love him and sweet talking. But he's like, he is like one of the top with more psychopathy and narcissism of any president ever. You know, JFK was up there, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, but people want to be conned. You know, he's a, he's a lover boy. So a lot of, especially women, but also men fall for this. He's a nice guy. Well, do you think psychopaths are not nice guys? You know, they are. That's how they get away with it. Uh, and, and so, you know, so people are, the general public, uh, a lot of them can be confused because they will completely fall in love with, with people with real narcissism and psychopathy because they're dreamy, you know, and they're, you know, he seems like a nice guy. Well, this is a warning signal to anybody. When you do that, you know, and you start voting for somebody or you're supporting somebody and, and, and it's almost like they're looking for somebody to be the most eligible bachelor or something. You know, he's dreamy. I'd love to date him. And he wouldn't fight, you know, he should be president or prime minister. You really want that as, you know, and, but people do it. You see it and they'll explain it to you. These are mature people will say that. And, you know, they're fools, obviously. And, and, and with somebody with a lot of, you know, psychopathic traits, I know suckers a mile away. I know who can be manipulated because they, they have this, this sort of, they're enamored by these con artists that are, you know, sweet talking prime ministers or presidents or anything. Whereas the ones that are really speak harshly, they don't like them. They'll go, well, he's has narcissism because they don't like him because he's the, he's reminds them of the boy that wouldn't date them or the boy that stole this girlfriend or, you know, he reminds them of somebody from earlier in their life. And so that's what they're doing, but they make the mistake of voting them in as let's say a president or prime minister or something it's it's suicidal but it happens constantly and so that's why if you say you know psychopaths must be also all must be narcissistic but it's not true it's not they don't necessarily have to you don't to manipulate you don't have to be narcissistic uh, to be a really dangerous either you know borderline psychopath or full-blown categorical psychopath you don't have to have narcissism but it helps for leadership, you know? And so, and, and, and so it seems that way, but I wouldn't buy the premise. Okay. You, you do mention in your book that uh, ask me, is there something to the effect of, if you ask me to define a psychopath, um, I wouldn't be able to do that. But if you ask me to show you one, I will be able to do that one. Do you want to speak a little bit um, to that one? What, what are the tells in, in everyday life of somebody who that does, does fit that bill. Yeah, they're, and the tells are, are difficult. And you have to, you know, somebody who is, well, I do, I have a couple of jobs that I don't, I don't put on my CV, but one is, you know, we, we work with two groups that try to overthrow countries, governments. Um, and I agreed to get, 
get along as go along with this as long as no violence because I'm, I'm very anti-violence uh doesn't mean i'm a nice guy but i'm anti-violence but you know using information and knowledge and all that quite happy with it and so but one of the things is i may you know we meet with the opposition and i'm not going to tell you the organization because they're very they're high, pretty high profile now uh, and it's like you know during the meeting when we have a three or four or five day meeting during the meeting go out and get drunk with this guy he's in the opposition he's he's the next in line if they we overthrow this you know fascist or, or communist or some dictatorial government he, he may be worse than the guy in there, right? So the so one of the things, and it usually takes a few hours of drinking, uh, and 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 warming up because he's you know with a smart psychopath, and because they're quite sophisticated, right? And it's it's a cat and mouse, and you look, you know, there's there are some things uh, that you can you have to look at the full the content of what they're saying. That's why it's not like that thing. But if a person over the period of an hour starts using an increase in the amount of use of personal pronouns that are inappropriate. So the total envelope or, you know, of personal pronouns, they always talk about me, I, me, 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 you know, that's a little bit of a tell uh, when it's not appropriate. And, and if you're somebody who's uh, sophisticated and political, you can tell when it's appropriate or not. But it takes some time, it takes a couple hours to read that. If you, they'll also start talking about their guts in a very unnerving way. You know, it's, it's, it's like the person who tells dirty stories that are not funny, they're just dirty and they're, you know, that's not what they do, but they talk about their, their own visceral processes in inappropriate ways, sprinkled in the middle of a conversation. Maybe when somebody else walks by, a woman may come into the conversation and they, say, they start saying some creepy things, okay? And, and, this is not diagnostic, but this is one of the things, you know, and, and it's true that when the psychopaths are talking, you know, if you look at, I grew up in a Sicilian Italian family, where there's all this talking with the hands, right? But what they tend to do is they tend to be moving their hands, it gets higher hands, it gets higher and higher. That's in some of them, right? Not in all of them. Uh, so there are these little physical tells and also in the, the narrative of how they're talking about things. And also, even the most sophisticated ones will look at causality in a funny way. You know, a full-blown, regular street psychopath, if you will. Now, this thing, if you say, well, who, and if it wasn't you, who killed it? Well, there was a bullet in this gun, and the bullet killed him. And the bullet was connected to the gun, you see. And the gun was there. And they'll never connect the hand to themselves. And that, there's a bit of that that you see. But you see that in the streets now. You know, there are political movements now where, you know, the idea that I, you know, the, the gun killed it. See, it's the gun's fault. It's not me pulling the trigger. Purely psychopathic. Blame externalization stuff. That sort of thing is a traits of psychopathy. And you can hear, you know, street criminals do, do this all the time. And they have excuses and blame externalization. But they don't make the connection. It's like, you realize that bullet. I can draw a bright line between that bullet and the, that guy's heart. And you're the gun, and your hand on the gun and on the trigger, and that hand connected to your basal ganglia, which is connected to your amygdala, and you did it, man. It's you did it. And they'll try to separate themselves by saying, "No, the bullet came out." You know, but they'll do it if you're talking to somebody who's sophisticated. They 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 haven't killed somebody, but they'll start blaming things that way. The the causal stream, the causal connections between things, you will see them starting to separate themselves from the cause of the problem, okay? And in, in, in it's very necessary that it's not part of the greater society, what this, this structure is, this moral structure is. And if it's very different, you're looking at psychopaths. So you can see them on any street now. Uh, they, you know, they really have come out of the, uh, and it's not like everybody who's causing mayhem is a psychopath or a sociopath. Uh, but some people just think they're, you know, they're, they're the avenging angels. <clears throat> but that is a type of, of this complex is like, I'm doing this to save the world. And so, so you have to listen for those, those things that are either that comport with or not comport with the subculture and the broader culture. And if it's really at odds and they really believe it, then you're talking more about a personality disorder. Oh, sure, maybe in other places murder is bad, but, you know, on my street, it's good. And so you start hearing generally have sorts of excuses. But you can imagine not any one of these you'd hear, but after a while you'll hear these build, you know, 
you, you'll see these getting put together in the in the narrative that the person is. And after two hours, and I make sure that uh, we have drinks together to loosen them up even further. You know, you don't want them on guard. And they and it's and it helps if they you know you've got to divulge yourself too, so you got to open yourself up. You know you and mm. so you, you have to open yourself up in their, the conversation to their manipulation because they're always if they're psychopaths they're always trying to read who, you know what is going on in your mind where are your your hooks, where are your weaknesses that's the and you know psychopaths are always doing that naturally where how do I get in there. How do I get in? What is the weakness? What is she, this girl I'm talking to the bar? Oh, she's got a problem with her father. And then work that angle. You're always listening for those things. Well, in a more sophisticated group where you're not talking about murder or something, uh, but simply, you know, oppressing all the people of the world or something, then, uh, then you can start to put together a story be, beyond what would be a kosher clinical, you know, uh, interview. As you know, clinical interviews how to do this, but if you're doing that, if you if you're doing that, nobody wants to go in and have that done if they're psychopath. Yeah, okay, I'm running for prime minister. I'm going to take over this place. And oh, by the way, I'll I'll have like a really full psychiatric. No, so that's why this kind of on the cheap, you know, it's something I can't do. I shouldn't. I can't really diagnose anybody, especially that. But for the organization, a couple of organizations I work with, I can get a hint. You know, get a hint and to start to talk about this person. Do we want to back this person? So in a, in a more, um, in a social media world where mm -hmm. meet people, you follow others, you chat with people online and you do all that sort of stuff. Uh, do you have any, any words around how to know the tells from a, from a media context now that everything's gone online and, and there's a lot more there's a lot more to interact with online rather than meeting someone face to face and, and connecting with them in, on that level. Uh, do you have any opinions on that one? Well, certainly if somebody <clears throat> is an asshole or a jerk, which I can be, right? That wouldn't be, you know, if somebody's like obnoxious or something, this is not what psychopaths do. The psychopaths are trying to get you to love them or to be very alluring. So if somebody is has a come on to you and it looks a little bit like a manipulation that's when you cut them off because that's usually the tell you a lot of people will have you know will will have a good sense you know after they're in their 30s and beyond they'll have a you know after about 35 you have a good sense who's trying to get in your pants in many ways and they're just too a little too sweet about it and there's there's you know you smell a con and those are the, those are the ones that have that you know the psychopaths certainly do that. And if they misplay it, they move too fast, then you got to look for that. But anybody who's looking for compliments, well, you're like dead meat because they're, you know, they'll, they'll pick that up. So you really got to, I think a person doing, they have to know themselves. Am, am I weak? Am, am I, you know, do I want to be, uh, do I want to be stroked? Do I want to be conned? Do I want, I want them to say, I love you. I want them to say, you're so smart. I want them to say, you know, you're really better, you know, you look great here, or you really dominated that group. That is, those for me are definitely warning signals. And if you feel the creeps that way at all, you just break it off and move on. You don't try to change them. Mm. I really like that one. Okay. And that's very practical, actually. Uh, so, so I want to I want to change uh, tunes here, uh, because at the beginning of the book, you mentioned, uh, you go, you go all the way back to King Henry II and his son, uh, King John Lacquard, uh, where, and you trace that to your own lineage and you, you compare the, what they did during their reigns and you, you trace, trace that all the way to uh, your family history. Do you mind speaking about, about that element? Well, yeah, this is, you know, there's a whole part of this that is, is kind of the, uh, it's kind of living room talk, you know, tell us a scary story, tell everybody, you know, loves that. And and and, and people say, have always said, you know, uh, we've got a horse thief and, a, you know, back in the 19th century, you know, all these bad people, but that, that washes out very quickly. That is those genetics that you get from one line or something. Yeah, you've got one line of people that are scoundrels or one or two people are scoundrels. That stuff washes out genetically. And if you look at the, certainly the, 
genographics, genographics of this that go back a thousand years, you would say, uh, you know, who's, you know, is, is that really enough? Well, in, in, our, in our family's case, we have two people. One is a New York a newspaper editor is a very good researcher and he's very interested, you know, for, for since when he was young. And another one who is a cleric, okay, who's, he's a cleric and he, and he loves genealogy and they know how to do research, like really like pr they're pros. And so they, over the years, uh, and, and this started back in the seventies and even before this information on our family, because, you know, in every family is usually one kid who likes the history of the family. And nobody else cares, right? Well, we have several of these in each of our families. We've got a large family, but, and so there's a critical mass of people to do this research in our family, and they did. So they found out, and it's very difficult because you have to go through. I spent a lot of money on books out there in the other room on tracing d different parts of the family, name by name. You got to connect all the dots, and so when you are, you know, you apply for like something like a son or son or daughter of the American Revolution or of uh, you know Mayflower, like we have six direct descendants, grandparents that were on the Mayflower, okay? And we have one other. So we have almost the largest number we're able to prove this, right? But, but you have to go through every person and prove it. So as the society you don't know what the, what the Mayflower is, um, what, can, you, can you describe that a bit? Yeah, so when the pilgrims left, in the 1600s from England, right? They went from England and then they went to the Netherlands and then, then they got together and then they came on the Mayflower to the Americas and they, you know, they landed it up in the Northeast. And, and, and that is the kind of how the whole, the British, you know, influence, it was a major one. It was also uh, yeah, at that time. And so, there were a small group of people that signed the Mayflower Compact, which was the kind of the beginning of the colonies here, really. And one, one of the beginnings, there's several of these, but one of a key one is the Mayflower. And they signed a compact, it's a very famous thing. And it's where our Thanksgiving, the American Thanksgiving is based on, because that group uh, was the ones that worked with the, you know, local, the, the local uh, Native Americans to make it through these those winters and everything. So there's a very rich history and Thanksgiving and it's, well, you know, there's a lot of hardship and every country has this kind of story and that for the United States is it. Uh, but there are also, uh, it, there are other societies and the people are very jealously guarded. You can't be part of the Mayflower group unless you really prove, you can't believe what you have to go through, but we can. And so we've got, you know, six that we can prove, and we just, so now we're officially that, but we're also sons and daughters of the American Revolution, the Civil War, the Wyoming Compact, Montana Territories, so our family goes way back, and uh, so it would be like the first, the first British settler in Australia, you know, it's the, whoever that was, mm -hmm. it was a little different with the Australians, but it was, <laughs> but it's the same idea, you know, and and so and we were able to trace these all back through all this careful research. And so people will say, well, everybody's connected to Charlemagne. So which, can you prove it? And very few people can prove it. We can. So we're directly connected to, to uh, not only in Charlemagne, who's behind it. It's like, well, what's the big deal? Well, the line that we're, you know, for this discussion, the line of kings were all the worst ones. They were all the worst, from. most violent lineage from Charlemagne. A lot of them said, you know, numerous were not bad, but in ours is like the whole worst group of just wanton destruction and death. And, and so when you look at that, you go, well, that's interesting, but it went further because as we look further into it, especially not me, but my, my two cousins, especially, and it, and it turns out that there's two other lines. So it's, it's, You've got three out of four lines of murderers and scoundrels and bad actors or people that would just leave their family. We have that. So this isn't just having like some bad guy in your background. We've got three lines on one side. It's, it's, then it's starting to look a little bit like genetics, right? Because mm. there's not a lot of, there's still dilution, 
but it makes this, I guess it makes the story fun because, you know, most of the people are in my family are not like that at all. And so it's, so it's, 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 it's a way of talking about, first of all, just because you got a few <clears throat> killers in your family doesn't really mean it. But if you got three lines <clears throat> out of four <laughs> that are full of killers, we're very aggressive people, <clears throat> very aggressive. Then you're starting to talk about something. There's, um, and so we've cataloged this and a lot of people in our family hate this. You know, I just, I think of course it's funny. And one of my brothers think it's funny, but a lot of them hate it. They, they, so they hate me talking about it. They just want to talk about the noble sorts of parts of our background. No, they're from royalty, you see. I said, no, we're not, from, we're from the murdering line of these people, not the, not the sweet, you know, it's like the noble king. So a lot of people are in denial of this stuff because they only want to hear like wonderfully powerful, positive stuff. And we, ours is not that way. That murderous royalty rather than the, the, uh, the rest of it. Oh yeah. And some of it's just, they, they hate it because then we finally get somebody who looks good. And it turns out, you know, you go there in, in long, you know, Long Island uh, and where he's buried. And it turns out he lives in the slaves graveyard. He had all these slaves. Okay. This is a direct, you know, direct grandfather. This was a new, a new one. And we, so we have, we know where the grave is and his whole history. But you say, on the other hand, he loved all the slaves mm -hmm. and he wanted to be buried with them. And this is true. But people, if you just say, well, you're slave owners, then they say, that's terrible enough. So you're out and, and they will ignore their own history of slaves. Uh, so with us, it's always like, oh, well, it sounds like good news. It says, not quite. And, but it goes back and forth. If you have a, a lot of, you know, chutzpah, if you will, if you have a lot of, a, a lot of smart, tend to have smart people in your family, this is going to happen, right? And it's not going to always be pretty. And in our case, it's not pretty. Mm. And it's not, it's not really funny. You know what I mean? I think it's funny, but nobody else in my family, except for you know, one other one, one woman who's up close to and she just thinks it's hysterical because it's not you really you know you you in the end it's you and and but the the history part i guess for me allows you to talk about the genetics and the non-genetics you know it's the dilution of it but you know there's a, you know, a recent thing which is just you know one of the most famous cases of of a of an unsolved murder in the united states was uh Laura Palmer, you know, the Laura Palmer person in Twin Peaks. And I don't, I think people around the world, I think have seen Twin Peaks. It was a David Lynch uh, TV show, but also a series of films that were quite weird and successful. And it's based on where I grew up. And I know the, you know, I used to fish there all the time. And I used to wear this, the real person it's based on because the writer, he's telling the story of when he grew up about this real event of this murder of this gal in a pond. Uh, this is our backyard. It's where I, you know, I used to park to go trout fishing over her grave. And her name was Hazel Drew. So this is now they've uh, come out with, a, there's a new uh, a film that's come out to look at who killed her, because this is the, the real Laura Palmer murder. Mm. Uh, if you look at that, the, there are two candidates that are the top uh, candidates for this. And it's my grandfather and great grandfather. Oh, wow. the murderer. So it's closer to home, right? Now, <clears throat> my people in my family will hear this. Part of my family will hear it. Not in my immediate family, but my extended family. They'll, they're they're going to hate me for telling you this. They're going to just hope that your reach of your podcast doesn't go very far. But I said, what if it's true? Why not? You know, and it's a, it's a bad thing. And you want to get rid of this. Because real psychopathy is about, it ruins the world. Let's face it, it ruins the world. It's not funny. Uh, the, you know what happened to me was funny, but psychopathy is not funny at all. And it's you know, it's, but and so we can use these, I, I think, these stories to tell about what people would consider evil, but not, or not just evil, but predatory, but not necessarily evil. Uh, because if you can't tell a good story, and it's got to be to me, it's got to be absolutely true. If you can't tell a good story, it doesn't really sink into people, right? Mm. It just becomes this clinical sort of like going to medical school thing. Here are the facts. And if you're a medical student, you're supposed to bite it and eat it. Uh, but, you know, if to really to have people listen, you have to have a really true story that's good. So for me, as these things have come out over the past couple of years and beyond, these are opportunities 
to try to teach people, the average person, about this, you know, the predators and what makes up these predators. Mm. I have two children, uh, a 10 year old and a six year old. And when I ask them what they would ask somebody who, who specializes in, in psychopathy, researches it and is How old are they? How old are they? 10 years old and six years old. So they came up with two questions for you, which I think, I mean, <laughs> you've addressed, you've addressed this in your book. Um, so we can build on them. But the first one from my 10 year old was, were you born like that? And the second one from my six-year-old was, do you like being a psychopath? <laughs> and I think that okay. the second one, the second one, you address the utility of psychopathy at the end of your book. Um, yeah. And the first one, I, I want to hear more about the, the cold cognition, the, the hot cognition that you talk about. Um, and just, just um, you know, take it as you will. Uh, take those questions. Sure. As you will. I, the first thing it would be, do you like whatever you are? Do you like being you? I love being me. I like myself and uh, I, throughout my life, have loved the whole thing. I mean, I really do. So the question is, do you, do you enjoy being yourself? The answer is absolutely. Do you like being yourself and what, any sort of gifts that you've been given, right? Including, you know, good family, but maybe some funky genes, but good genes. Um, I'm completely uh, reveling all of that. And I would never change anything. I just, you know, I love my life. And I, and even though some of it's not so great, you know, really is, you know, I've been not nice to people. It worse than not nice. Let me put it, it makes it sound like, oh, you know, well, I've hurt people. So I'm not, it's worse than that. But, um, but so that's the answer to that question. So if the question is, do we like being a psychopath? Well, it turns out I don't quite reach the threshold it's like you know if you're on the, on the hair test if you need a 28 to 30 i'm a 27 if you're on the, a ppi the same thing i don't quite cut into there because i don't have some of the traits these you know the 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 this the, the very negative traits you know there's a whole as you know there's a whole group of them that are nasty you know that these criminal nasty traits i don't have those i have pro-social traits. So since I have these pro-social traits, uh, it means I can navigate society. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I'm pro-social. It means I have traits that allow me to navigate easily society and seem completely normal. But I don't have these other, uh, these, you know, some of the real harsh negative ones. And that keeps my number below it. So my answer is I am not a psychopath, but I have, a, you know, I have, I have too many traits with it and that are, and every psychiatrist I've ever talk to and everybody knows me and knows about it they know these and so i know that's there but i'm not a so do i like being a psychopath the answer is no i'm not a psychopath i just have some you know some fun traits uh no but i do you know i do have those traits and most of them are, they're called pro-social and certainly um the those that allow you to succeed in life and, and get along so i have those so that's I'm not trying to be cagey for your your one child's, but that's that's the best answer I can give to that. And in, in terms of the other, no, nobody's. No, there's no sense that you're born a psychopath. And and you know you can't tell by looking at your genetics, the brain scans, other things, uh, in order to determine if you're a psychopath. You have to talk to a psychiatrist, a psychotherapist who is trained in uh, personality disorders generally, but also the cluster Bs, especially in a psychopathy. It's not easy to diagnose because it's not one thing. There's so much overlap, as you know very well, there's so much overlap in the traits with other, uh, other uh, personality disorders or even some extreme normal traits. So it's, you have to have that. So the way you determine this, first you determine it by working with a knowledgeable psychologist, psych, psych, psychiatrist, uh, psychoanalyst who's very hip in this. And they determine if you have this. And, and part is, it's not just making a checklist. They've got a, you know, the psychiatrist, as you know, they, they, have to re, they have to talk to you to see how you feel about what you do and what you think. And that's not on the checklist so, so well. So you have to have both structured and unstructured sorts of interactions with people. And it takes some time to really get, how does this person think about it? 
And, you know, for me, uh, you, you know, it's, it's very obvious to people, you know, when I'm asked this, that they, I say, well, and truthfully, I know that this is what the traits of psychopathy, but I don't care. I really, really don't care. This is how I am and tough beans, but it's not, I'm not trying to hurt people, right? But uh, you'd have to find that out. So that's the first part about that. The other thing is when, you know, once you find out you do have something, it could be psychopathy, then you say, why? How'd you get there? You, and you really got to separate at, that from sociopathy and the psychopathy and sociopathy, first of all. But then you can look at the brain scans and see those parts of the brain that look like they're non-functional or very low function. And there's a pattern of those that are very recognizable in what's called the social brain, and which is part of the limbic or emotional brain. And there's a whole group of C-shaped structures in the brain that include the amygdala, the anterior insula, the hippocampus, uh, the other parts of the cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex, inferior prefrontal cortex. There's that whole group that's turned off inappropriately. And that's very, you know, if you know your psychopath, you say, well, you have the brain connections, the brain activity of that. And you can look at the, the genetics. So, that, you know, it, it seems that you have to have a certain percentage of the genes to really get there. And so if we look at any personality trait uh, and we say, well, you know, each personality trait is strongly influenced by 15 genes. It could be 10, 30, you know, it's, and even up to 100 genes or 200 genes, but the main ones, it could be 10 to 15. And each gene, you have at least two types of alleles and one allele that you inherit from your mother, one allele from your father. And those can be high, could be high aggression or low aggression. And if you inherit two from both parents, high aggression, if they both have them and you get them, you will be a very aggressive person. Doesn't make you criminal, doesn't make you a psychopath, but you will have a trait that would be, you know, very high aggression and maybe even violence. So that would, so that's the basic trait, but it doesn't make it immoral, it doesn't make it illegal, it doesn't make it criminal. But if it's fixed in that position, then you have trouble. The way it gets fixed is by the early influence uh, of, you know, the, the, I think the quickest and true way to look at it is that <clears throat> people under stress, and, and not everybody sees stress the same way. You get two brothers, you take one, you throw them down the stairs, they throw, and they come up laughing and everything, you can't get to them. These people are not going to become that, you know, they, and then the other one, you look at them funny and they break apart. So everybody, you know, has a certain resilience or they're, or, or the opposite of resilience are very vulnerable. So you have to have the inherited, a number of these, the, the, the alleles that either all high or low functioning for each trait, <clears throat> enough of them that you have these fundamental strong traits. And if the abuse early on or abandonment even, that is a stressor. And so your cortisol is released. That cortisol quickly travels into the brain, especially the frontal lobe. And, and the, all the areas I just mentioned, I'm doing the psychopathy, it travels there. And that will then start to induce epigenetic changes. And it's a very strong, persistent, and you have that group of genes, it becomes a permanent mark. So those genes the, or the promoters of the genes are ter, per, you know, turned on basically permanently. And that's the trouble. And so, so you may be born with a whole bunch of alleles that correspond to high aggression, low emotional empathy, uh, and you know, this different personality traits of, of, of extroversion and, and, or introversion, or, you know, and there's, depending on how you cut it, a whole group of traits that personality traits that are line up with psychopathy and other, you know, personality disorders. Well, so what happens is you get, you're fixed now because the cortisol has added a methyl group or an acetyl group to a histone, which then fixes that. It's like putting up, take a brick in your, on your car and putting it right on the accelerator all the time. The brick is on the accelerator, right? Or the brick is under the accelerator so it never turns on. So this combination is, uh, is set very early in life. So the psychopathy itself, it's really a combination of the genes and in a hostile environment very early in life. It has to have at the right time. Birth to about two, at four, it doesn't seem to have much of an effect. So it's this window opens up and you can look at it. The way I look at it, it's this is the way for the social brain and the emotional brain is saying early on, what kind of world am I being 
born into? Is it a kind, loving, caring world? In which case, I don't need to have all these like fight and flight and defensive, aggressive sorts of uh, traits. But if I'm, you know, if I'm abandoned, beaten up, and bullied when I'm you know, really young, this is a hostile world. So I better get my brain permanently tuned up to live in this environment. And, um, and this happens for, for, you know, your metabolic system. It was found, you know, for the Swedish um, famine of the 19th century, there's a series of them, and also the Dutch famine during the Nazi regime, that the, that person who had those genes uh, who would then starved at a certain period, early, earlier in their life, or five to seven different times, and it depends on whether you're male or female, those people become permanently fat, or they're permanently become addicted to, to smoking. So it really can, you know, these things can jump generations. And it's almost like a way of, you're going to be, you're, you're being born into an environment and you better be ready for it. This is a cold environment with no food. You better get fat fast and early, right? Fast and furiously, uh, because this is how you're going to you're going to be saved. Uh, but in this, you know, in this world, being you know, chronically fat is not a great thing. But some people are really tuned to be fat, and it was protective, but it, not in this world so much. It could be. So the same thing with the with the violence. This is a way to look at it. So no, you're not born a killer. You're not born a psychopath. But you're born with genetically determined traits that are already there. And if you, those traits in particular line up with any of these psychiatric disorders, and then you're abused, this is the trouble. Then you have, that's when it's, that's when it's made. So it's usually made the first two years of life. I've heard it said that uh, people who, who score highly on a psychopathy test have what's called a, a an autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So they, they, their autonomic nervous system functions completely differently to uh, an average person. Is this something that you found in, in your well, research? Well, yeah, well, people, because it's related to stress, these, uh, those areas of the brain and the hypothalamus that control the autonomics, or even some of the peripheral system, you know, even out to the stellate ganglia, where people who have PNES, you know, they have these, you know, these, uh, it looks like epilepsy, but it's just overwhelming stress. And, and so uh, people who are abused early on who have this, they can also have a uh, overwhelming uh, sympathetic response. Everything's fight, flight, everything is perceived as danger. I know, I, you know, you're coming to kill me, I'm going to kill you right now. And everybody's looking around, what are you talking about? So that seems to be true, but not for all of them. You see, there's a, this agitated state for a psychopath, right? They, some, and, and there are some that are very cool, calm, and collected. So there are different kinds of psychopaths, but the ones that are these agitated types and who, who fly off the handle and kind of more impulsive and hot-headed, that type will have that particular uh, autonomic response too, generally. Do you have any, any stories about uh, people who, who may be well-known that fit different molds of psychopathy in terms of their reactions and, and that sort of stuff? Are you allowed to share um, you know, the story well, no, you may it, come across? No, you know, because almost all of the analyses I had done from 89 on, I made sure that I never knew who it was. Hmm. Now, sometimes I found that afterwards by mistake, but I didn't want to, and, you know, as a scientist, you don't want to know that. I've gotten feedback on some of them where I could see where, you know, it said, well, looking at this scan, this, this, this person is probably very aggressive, uh, probably also has a speech, a, a, you know, defect, some sort of speech disorder, uh, probably has a certain kind of memory problem. You can see by the damage. And I've been like dead on because I know those, the brain system. So you can really, you know, uh, predict it that way. But a lot of them that, that I did, I never know who they were, mm. you know? And if, and if I do know going in, especially, it ruins the experiment. I, I can't be, you know, neutral. So it's, but so, you know, I, I think people would think that you, you'd want to know all the time, but no, you want to, you know, I want to be as naive as possible in, in, when looking at the genetics and looking at the, um, with, with, with the brain scan. Some kind, sometimes you can't avoid it. Now there are people or, you know, I was contacted by one person, a, a, a writer uh, who, said that the person they represented they wrote a book about it was the worst pedophile and rapist in american history he's right now he's in 
prison, being moved from prison to prison for 1,600 years. And, and I spent a lot of time talking. So I talked to him and he said, look, I've done a lot of bad things. I want to make up for it. I want you to do a little analysis on me, do the genetics and all that. So it doesn't happen again. I said, and I knew like very quickly, the guy wasn't a psychopath, he was a sociopath. And, what, and, and, and then as we delved deeper, he had a brother who did the same thing. I talked to the brother, he didn't care at all. He was, and he was the psychopath. He wasn't the famous one though. There was the, it was the, you know, the, the one who was getting even, the young loser who was being bullied and raped himself. But then I found out that after talking that it was the parents that were raping their own children, their own sons. They didn't do it with the daughter. I talked to the daughter, but they have, and the, it was the mother who orchestrated everything they would get. Um, you, you know, they would get their two or three-year-old sons in bed with them and then start to sexually abuse them. You know, and they did this with them. They didn't do it with the daughter. It was only with the son. So, uh, and, and then I found out there was a whole family of them in Arkansas. They're all really that have this. So here's a case where it looks like probably if there's a genetic, the components to it, uh, this is a perfect example of it. Uh, but in one case, to get to answer your question, one of them was very agitated all the time, always angry, always hostile, hostile. The other guy was sweet as can be. And so didn't have that. They did the same things, but two brothers, same house, um, at least 50% genetics, the, the same, and the, the same sort of early abuse, but the reaction to it was very different. And they expressed it. The, you know, one is saying, I owe this to the world. And the other one is saying, uh, it was extremely hostile. So, so the answer is, you see a mix of these, even in one family in, in the same age almost. So yeah, that, that happens. And I've seen several of those, but that one I know intimately, right? Yeah. 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 And, and it seems um, on that point, it seems that, uh, it, well, it really does explain the differences in, in sociopathy and, and psychopathy and how they, you know, how they both present differently in the ta uh, to the table. One of the questions that was run by me uh, was around, for people who do act out on on their impulses, on, on their violent impulses, is there ever anything that the victim can do or say that would, would keep them safe, for example? Uh, is there anything that a victim could do to escape um, or say something that could kind of... Yeah, I mean, that, the obvious thing that everybody hates to hear is you learn to read these people and, and how they're, you know, conning you, sweet talking you, what your own weaknesses are, knowing your own weaknesses, because they can read them. They're going to read them. Even a guy's not too smart, a really good, you know, psychopath. They're looking for those weaknesses in you. You hate your mother, you hate your father. Maybe you're a little homely and, you, you, and you've, you're very upset about that. So you say, oh, you're a really pretty girl. So whenever you hear that stuff, it's head the other direction immediately. Uh, but if you, you know, so they're looking for those weaknesses and that's, that's what you look for. And I can see people who are very vulnerable. Like, you know, you can just, uh, you know, learn to, you know, to see them. And I work with a guy who could read two, two years old, like amazingly. And he, he knew it was going to become a psychopath at two. He wouldn't, he didn't want to tell this to people because I was writing my book, you know, he and I did a lot of work together. He says, there's no way, man. He's, I'm not going to tell people I, I'm able to do this because I'll never be, I'll never have a, a peaceful day in my life between reporters and parents and, you know, it'll be hell. And so a lot of these people that know this, you always get this thing, well, you can't, you can't be diagnosed as a psychopath until you're 18. What a bunch of bullshit. I mean, it's a, it's a taxonomic legal insurance thing, but, you know, you can, you know, a really good psychiatrist who's, you know, especially somebody who's a pediatrician too, uh, they, they can read these kids like, and they know. They knew the way they look, the way, how cold they are. I mean, every two-year-old who stands in front of you uh, and you can't see the TV is acting a bit sociopathically, right? There's normal behavior that two and three-year-olds do. That's psychopathic or sociopathic. But beyond that, there is, in these kids, a real coldness, a real iciness that is beyond this. That it's, and and, and with, a, with a good clinician, they can read this early, they're, they're, they're the, the hair on their back was right up. They, they, they see it. So you can see it, you know, early on, but you, you don't want to, 
you don't want to say this because you could be wrong. And if you're wrong, you've damned this kid forever. You've damned the family forever. So here's something, you know, if we can, we, we can do it. One of the worst things that plagues society is psychopathy and sociopathy. And it's the one thing that's hundred percent preventable because if we, you go in there early enough and the kid's born, you know, from the genetics, you know, who's vulnerable and who is, and who could be easily triggered by violence and, and bullying, then you, you can get them early before that happens. But the families that are in are the types of people that won't let you in in the first place, because they may be, you know, abusive to begin with. So it's, you know, then you have a situation where, well, why don't we just make it mandatory? And there's whole group, you know, many people would say it's public, public policy, let's make it mandatory for testing. We go in and see how you're treating your children and how this household is, we do genetic testing. This to me sounds a bit, this is draconian sort of brave new world stuff that, you know, is maybe as bad or worse than it's a disorder because, you know, flagrant attack on individual rights. Uh, but in today's political system, you know, world, a lot of people don't care about individual rights. It's all group thing. So if there's more chance that there's going to be psychopathy prevented because there's so many people who want, who are very open to this sort of red brigade, Maoist, Marxist sort of really left, I, what I call left-wing fascism. Uh, by the way, I'm not a Republican. I know I didn't vote for Trump. But you, you, know, mentioned, you mentioned in your book uh, about your political, well, your gearings towards uh, libertarianism. And yeah, I have, I'm about the, it's about the freedom of the individual hmm. and about not trusting or allowing large organizations to lord it over us. But, you know, but since I'm a person who is, you know, it's say, well, yeah, you're a psychopath, of course you like that. Well, no, I'm a, somebody who feels I can take care of myself and my family. So, and I don't want people uh, ruining society by saying, look, it, we're going to do this. This is what happens to totalitarian governments. They say, we're going to protect you from these evil people, but you're going to give up your, you know, many of your rights to do it. And there are people, especially today, you know, in the past couple of years, who are willing to do it. It's incredible. Uh, but a lot of those people don't know the history of, of um, you know, fascism and communism and, and treachery. You know, they just don't know. They're ignorant. And so this is a prime time for this. But it's also you could say, well, is it a prime time to get these passed so we can check to make sure that there are no kids that are being brought up by psychopaths or in an abusive mm. situation and say, well, yeah, we fixed that, but we've made things worse. You can see how this could go back and forth. But yeah, no, I've always been a, a libertarian uh, my wife's a libertarian. I've never voted for a Republican in my life, and, and I didn't vote for Trump or any, you know, uh, but I'm a libertarian because I like tiny government. I like no war, I, I, you know, I like you know, defense, obviously. And I, and, I, and I don't like people telling other people what to do, not just me, but any sorts of, you know, personal behaviors and anything to do with sex or, or gender orientation or drugs or prostitution, anything like that, any, any libertarian is, is, is against regulating because it's, you know, those people should be free to do what they want. So libertarianism is on one hand more left than anybody could imagine. It's extreme liberalism, but with a small government, you know? So that's the combination. But yeah, uh, and I, I say that up front because I think everybody, you know, I, you know do it for a lot of talks or I did to let people know that I'm an agnostic. I was brought up Catholic, but I'm an agnostic. I'm not an atheist, but you know, I, it's a way of saying I don't know what the hell's going on, and I certainly don't, you know, in the ultimate way. Uh, and also, these are my politics, and so I, you know, understand that my opinions on this, so my, uh, hopefully not the storytelling, not the, you know, the true stories, but my opinions on this are probably comport and are activated by these political beliefs that have to do with, you know, individualism. But, you know, also I'm um, for, you know, if somebody breaks the law, somebody kills somebody, they're out, man. Mm. So I'm not like, you know, permissive in that way. I'm, I'm for a st strong police, but, but the laws, I would, I would get rid of 80% of the laws having to do with your own personal choices, how you live, uh, and, you know, all of that. So that's, that's the, 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 being a conservative or being a Republican are very different than libertarian in this matter. As an adjunct to that, I, I've noticed that with uh, with what's going on in the world today and the the you know widespread lockdowns and all, all that, uh, how that impacts uh, various individuals and businesses. At, at least in Australia, the the 
it was the libertarian parties that spoke the most against that and it was sure and it was more the uh i hesitate to to say it but the socialist um underpinned uh labor parties or 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 other types of parties Uh, and i'm not politically uh, i don't have enough knowledge to to make a political commentary um but in my own own kind of workings there it was a libertarian so hey let's get the kids back at school let's let's uh do a, a measured response let's try to figure out um a proportionate response to to these pandemic uh have you have you any words of wisdom to to relate to any of this because you did talk about the well, if you, I, I do it. Yeah. what's that you talked about the libertarian brain a little bit in your book as yeah, well. yeah and it always comes across as you know kind of kind of cold it's like with that and we can talk about empathy here it's like the different kinds it's really very different kinds but uh you know, I don't want to see anybody else being lorded over. I don't, and and it's and it's usually there are you know the far right and the far left are very similar, so it's not about just the far left, far right. So you know, left wing fascism. There's a lot of fascism. There's not. And it's just like there was left and right Hegelianism. This all comes from Hegel, you know, and then goes into Marx, but then goes into Nazis versus the communists. And then that then developed into postmodernism, and then after that with the Herbert Marcuse into what we have now, which is wokeism. You know, it's the it's the the the, the wokeism and critical race theory. That's all derived from Hegel, from from left Hegelism. That is the the young Hegel Hegelians, which Marx was. So you can trace those uh, back to that, and as I've always used it. So I spent a lot of time in the past ten years going through the development of the philosophical systems from pre-Greeks. Uh, and then all, you know, and a lot of the political systems, especially from the late 18th century onward, to see how those line up and how the, what leads to tyranny. But certainly always the, you know, the, the far left, you know, most of the left, including the far left, but also far right, they want to lock down personal liberties. They'll do anything to restrict your motion and to get you into accepting this. You can't go outside, you have to do this. Even though any common sense person would say, well, I know how to do this for all sorts of diseases. I, you know, well, well, I don't want you getting me sick. Well, just don't go near me. You know, it's like, take care of yourself. What do you, you know, it's like, what are you, a fool? Of course, but they, you know, so they appeal to that. So that's been that way since the, uh, since the late, uh, uh, 1700s, when a lot of this first took root, and then through around 1800 with uh, Joseph de Maestre, who really was the architect for for far left, far right, and, and terrorist jihadist groups. It's all the same. But in and I've given talks with him, one of the head, you know, the guy was head jihadist in, in the UK uh, through the Royal Society, and he and I gave a talk. And he got out because he saw what th- that that group was, which is cruelty and getting even. It was it wasn't a positive thing. So he got out. But we we both gave a talk on that. But if you look at the philosophers, the political philosophers, I try to follow it in parallel with what I know about biological psychiatry, you know, genetics, etc. Uh, but certainly, if you go, if you look at the young Hegelians through Marx. You know, Marx's son-in-law was the, he's the one that brought, he, he started the Paris Commune in 1871, which is just what Antifa does. If you look at Antifa anywhere in the country, you know, anywhere in the world, they set up blockades and they isolate and they're very violent and, and they're, they're anarchists, but they're left anarchists. They're not true anarchists. It's not, a true anarchist doesn't want, a libertarian is an anarchist in the sense that they don't want a big government, but these are left anarchists. They want it, but they want to control it, right? It's very different. And so the Antifa uh, uh, from 1871, and then the, you know, Marx's son-in-law after that Paris Commune in 1871 broke down, he then went to Spain and he formed, he created the background for the Communist Party. And he, and, and, and somewhat the anarcho uh, uh, communists and syndicalists too, that formed all those groups for the Spanish Civil War. Those are all, you know, if you look at the Spanish Civil War, it's exactly what's going on now. So if you look at the people who are the leaders, they they see themselves as Rosa Luxemburg. They see like AOC in the United States, and all these they they model themselves after like Rosa Luxemburg, who's a you know communist, 
And when it didn't work, she became very violent uh, communist. And, uh, but also people like La Passionera, who was the main communist spokesperson uh, during the Spanish Civil War, uh, and a communist who was, I mean, there's passion. It's always about passion and emotion. It's not about thinking. Uh, but those people, the, the, the communists in the United States were like they call the squad. Uh, they're either been trained as Marxist or as Red Brigade, you know, Maoist. And they're very open about this. Same with BLM. And so this is all the communists, but they did the same thing. You can see the same exact thing. Those same people were in the uh, Spanish Civil War. They were in the Spartacist revolt in the, you know, 1918 to 1920. They were in the, all of these revolts is the same people. There's nothing new with them. But one of the main things is to use terror, keep people scared, but to close things down so people can have individual freedoms and to keep them scared all the time. And so usually, and you can see the far right can do this in terms of morality. The far left will do it by making people scared of everything, whether it's, you know, the climate's going to burn up. You look at somebody like, you know, the, the heroes are very strange. They're the, these little autistic uh, uh, kids who are passionate and they know nothing about the weather and know nothing about the climate, but they become the heroes because it's a passion. So it's all about passion with, with the, especially the left and you stop thinking. So it's the main thing is to, to keep, keep in terror, keep them terrified, close them in. So they're afraid to go outdoors. They're afraid to socialize, keep them separate from each other. And this is what this, you know, this would be the, the analysis of the, well, these lockdowns that are continuing to be completely silly, uh, it, uh, but that's part of what the, that's what the left has always done, and so it's it's very predictable, and you just keep people terrified. There's always got to be scared. They're not scared every day of something. You got to remind them that the you know the sea level is going up. You got to remind them that there's another terrible plague coming. You got to remind them that there's you know with the violence, and that's. That's what they do. That's their business, and they're in every country. Uh, but so, yeah. I mean, that's how I feel about it. And I hate to see anybody. It's not just me. I hate to see anybody controlled by somebody else. It's just it's reminiscent it, of an Orwellian nightmare. Um, to oh, completely. Like oh, yeah. It's completely or it's 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 completely Orwellian. And or, Orwell himself, you know, he became he was uh, one of the International Brigade guys. A lot of those people, the International Brigade. They thought it was their freedom fighters. And once they got in, they realized a bunch of violent Marxists that were taking, you know, they were, they were taking their marching orders from the Comintern in, in Moscow, you know, the Kremlin. And it, it, once they found out they, they were had, they all got out. Orwell got out. He was like, I had no idea. These were communists. They were violent. They're, it, it had nothing to do with freedom. It was the opposite. But they, can, they, they work on people just like a psychopath does. So people in the far left and far right will manipulate the same thing. And, and uh, you know, countries or societies are not really psychopathic, but they have some principles that are very similar to uh, what a psychopath will do. When, once they read what you want, what do you, you know, don't you hate, you know, with now it's like, don't you hate that kind of man? Isn't he the one who torment? Isn't he like your uncle, your father who didn't let you have the car? Isn't he the one that wouldn't date you or didn't, you know, all this stuff. And they remind you, isn't it it's that guy? It's that guy. It's always that guy. So they get you, they get, especially young people, they uh, to just hate that person. And this is, you know, and they create another sort of vision. And Orwell really got into it. So when Orwell was first writing, they thought, you know, he was really talking about, he was an anti-fascist, but he was an anti-communist too. You know, they're the same thing. You know, that's why to talk about left and right, far left and far right, it's not about being liberal or conservative, nothing at all. So, so uh, for me, I can see the parallels in the way sociopaths and psychopaths work and the way these radicalized groups who are taking over the world now by reminding you, it's just like you go into the bars, what is this girl upset about? She's mad that she doesn't, she's not as cute as she wanted to be. She's a little overweight. Uh, she doesn't get the date she wants to. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to become the good guy. And she's going to fall in love with what I'm saying. And then I got her. Same thing these groups do, right? And they, that's, they carefully do it just like any you know, psychopath would. So there is a parallel to what's happening socially, right? 
uh, and especially in the past you know, s- uh, six years, but it's been the, they don't have to plan anything because it's always been there. It's been there for 200 years, it's the same plan. We, we, we know so much about the history around uh, the Nazi Germany, uh, but yeah. the, over the past uh, year or so, I've been doing more and more digging into the Soviet uh, crimes and how you have two, two opposites that are both at their extremes capable of so much terror inflicted on, on its people. So you've got Alexander Solzhenitsyn who talks about his experiences in the Gulag archipelago and the, the almost like the psychopathic uh, guards in a sense, they, they were kind of, they were all the feeling ones were weeded out in the recruitment oh, yeah. process. And only the ones who are completely devoid of any sense of morality were able to to make it as a, as a guard in the gulags. And you had no comfort in where to rest your head, who you're going to be speaking with. Uh, these are all preconditions to, uh, I don't even know what, it's, it's madness. I work, and I work with a guy uh, who devised a lot of torture techniques in the, in, the, in the 70s. He was part of the Ukrainian KGB. And he and I happened to come together in a series of films called Dow, D-A-U which came out last year. These films are all about psychopathy, but it's how individuals of different groups, you know, two straight people, uh, two gays, uh, two lesbians, two, a mother and a daughter, uh, you know, different pairings of two criminals, how they, so it's a a series of these films, really quirky, really violent about psychopathy. So I was brought in as been as an advisor and I also act in it. I'm not an actor, but I acted in it. And you want to see, this was a, 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 an excellent, cringeworthy sort of a treatment of real psychopathy. But the one guy who was KGB, who was, uh, he and I are in one of the uh, uh, scenes together that was, uh, and we became friends after this because he was, uh, you know, w- w- they brought me in to confront him, right? It's, it was like the two psychopaths coming together. It's, it's, and it's not because I'm just in that scene, but the way it was crafted, it's worth watching because it's about, uh, and, I, and I, I liked the way it was put together because it wasn't like left or right. It's like you're far left, far right. They're the same people and they're trying to get the same people to back them. And they're, so don't say, you know, you're, well, that communists are better than Nazis, Nazis, but forget it. No, they're the, they are looking, they're, they're the same people, right? And so, you know, if during the you know the work up to the lead up to the to World War II, of course, you know wh- what was the communism? What were the Nazis about? Well, they both hated capitalism, right? They both hated all the same stuff, and they were actually trying to get the support of the same weak people, who felt like, you know, is uh, isn't that the person who abused you? Isn't you know to get them to join it to create the monster, and then to you know work to really work on them to to say look at i'm willing to give up all my freedoms if you protect me and so and and i've done really a whole bunch of talks around this especially around what happened in russia you know 300 years of czarist rule but also i worked with the guy one of the heads of blm some seven years ago six years ago about the effects of 300 years of slavery and how this can create epigenetic you know transgenerational epigenetic marking and my whole group of people, why do you have so many Russians still, they would, they gladly will vote in a tyrant. Well, they were marked, they've been had that for hundreds of years. So it's the same czarist police, the same, it's the same thing they've always had and they're comfortable with it. So they'll swear by this. They want tyranny, not all of them, but there's enough of them. Uh, and and, and you, you see the same thing with why are certain groups of people who have been trod on everywhere in the world and you know with with the blm guy i said well this is a case of slavery but this is you know this is true it has nothing to do with black people this is just as a, a group that spent you know 100 200 300 years being oppressed and abused and you know at, at that point being baked into the dna as it were you know uh would be the epigenetic trans uh, generational stuff where in order to survive you got to be a tough son of a bitch you got to be aggressive all of them. So it's not it's not a race or a country, but you can see this in different parts of the, the world, and the, and so the you know the Russians are another good example 
for this, why there's so many that's, that want tyranny, right? They, they, want to, they want somebody to beat the other tyrant up, right? They want, I like Stalin because he's going to kill Hitler and Hitler's going to kill, you know, this kind of stuff. And, um, but you can see them generating hatred they, they, and it's a stepwise process. And like I said, that process really goes back. Uh, it was pretty mature about a little over hundred years ago. You know, in, in, the, in the Wehrmacht, when the was the communists and the, uh, the beginning of the Nazis, proto-Nazis, they were Nazis then, but the more fascist uh, sort of attitude, they were building these techniques up and they became more mature until, you know, then in the you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, you had Marcuse who perfected them as how to, how to, how to create. With him, he wanted a one world government and he wanted it to be a Marxist. So that's, and so a lot of the, you know, intellectuals and, you know, the people who live right around here, they were taught by this. I mean, you got so many, so you get so many Marxists in, in universities, you know, in American universities, otherwise they were taught by these, they go directly can draw that right line back to Marx's son-in-law in 1871 on the Paris Commune. That's where, it, but it goes back to Hegel. Then it goes, and you don't want to blame Kant. Kant, you know, is the dialectic, but he was, you know, it was a bastardization of both Kant and Hegel, but that's where it gets its roots. And it's in the, the psychological uh, games that are played have, have been perfected. So people who think that they're, they're seeing something new, they, they, gotta, they gotta look at some history, some not only, philosophical history, but the social engineering history and the history of war and civil war. Yeah, it seems to me that um, at least in these days, we're, we're a little bit more ignorant of what's come before us because everything is just here and now. Uh, clickbaits and um, instant yeah. gratification and all, all that sort of stuff, social media. Uh, so, I mean, we can bag on it, but we can also you know, re recognize the utility of it, which is why we're meeting today. I mean, you know, in a way. Uh, you, you mentioned but yeah, it, it, if you look at, and, and this is the third time I really jumped in and rudely interrupted you, no, but you're going to go you're, ahead. You're yeah. too many interesting points, and I got to get I'm it. interviewing you. I'm interviewing you. Okay. You know <laughs> <me>. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, for, for, I think for people to understand the whole context, you know, we've gone through right now where it's just like it was in 1914. There were, you know, several generations went by where nobody had any memory of war. And it was like the nicest summer in history. The weather, nobody ever thought there would be a problem. That, that we did with World War I and then World War II is just the continuation of the European Civil War, right? And with a little break in between. And this is the Cold War as a continuation of that. So, but that, you know, that summer, that beautiful summer, 1914, most of the people didn't have a memory. They would have to go, you'd have to go back to the Napoleonic Wars and who was, you know, and so it's hardly anybody. And then you'd have to go back to the, all the European revolutions of 1848, which were sort of against the church and monarchy. They weren't revolutions. They weren't like Marxist or fascist. Right? This was like, everybody would consider like good revolutions to get the yoke of feudalism off of you, uh, you know, that everybody agrees with. So it was like a lot of nonviolent, 1848 was the biggest year of uh, revolution. So even the people who had memories of that, there wasn't a lot of killing done. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't much tyranny. Before that, you'd have to go to the French revolution, but nobody had a memory. So a lot of the kids today, see for us, our parents, we're in World War II, we're in Vietnam, we, in our generation. They know a lot about war and how awful it is. And there's their hackles are up by people who are obvious, groups that are obviously trying to take over the world or take over a lot of land, et cetera. So people in our generation, even, I'm a boomer, of course, and but people even with the, that are Gen X, you know, Gen X boomers get along famously, great. you know. To, to, to boomers, Gen X's are the improvement of our generation, doing things correctly. You know, you can have fun, but you don't have to pollute. You don't have to throw this shit out the window, right? You can have a lot of fun here, but be nice when you're doing, you know, because, and so for, you know, boomers love Gen Xers and even some Gen Ys if they're tuned in. After that, uh, even Gen Xers and Gen Y, you know, Gen Xers and certainly boomers and the older ones that are almost now half generation. And they're horrified. 
because there, there, we have a whole bunch of people just like 1914, nobody had a memory of war. So all of these things like, well, sure, I'll give up my rights. I don't, what's wrong with communist China? They seem to be making money and I don't care. Do I really want rights? That just seems like a pain in the ass. You know, I, I have the responsibility. Please take my responsibility from me. So you get a lot to us. You see a lot of kids that in, you know, who are now between 18 and, and, and 35, 38, and we're, we're horrified. It's not that I don't have a bunch of people I don't love in that, in that thing, but as a, as a political entity, it's horrifying because it's, first of all, they're completely naive to war. They, they, are, they don't know how bad communism is or Nazism, fascism. They don't know how bad it is. So it's like, oh, that's just shit, that's shit from the past. And so here, this is a perfect time for, they've waited, you know, in the, in, 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 they were just waiting for in the United States for the George Floyd thing to happen. That was just, it's going to happen. We're just going to wait. And then we're going to, you know, we're going to turn over the society, but it's happening everywhere in the world, except for communist China, except for, you know, even, but even Russia. And so uh, this is a very, very scary time because this is either, you know, we're headed to like with World War I, a whole new series of terrifying conflicts and mass murder or a whole round of new oppression by a uh, fascist, uh, communist, you know, the, to me, they're the same uh, uh, people with a whole bunch of kids just with their arms out welcoming it. Yeah, this, so it's, you know, uh, so that seems to be, I mean, I have no great insight here. You can ask anybody. My, <laughs> anybody my, um, say this. my grandmother, uh, she's 90, uh, 93, 94 now. And she was 15 years old when the Russians uh, walked through her village in, in Romania. And so Romania early on in the war was allied with Germany. And, and so when Russians came, came through, uh, they all ran to the woods because they knew what the Russians were, were all about at that time. My father actually escaped the uh, Ceausescu regime, the communist Ceausescu regime. He had to cross over into Serbia in the dead of night and uh, go on from there into Austria where he spent months in a in a detention camp with his pregnant wife in Australia uh, you know about to be married off to another person um, it's it's it comes to a point where these regimes and, and I know we're, we're kind of um, going going into a different topic which I which not I, really I, not 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 to me but okay. And I just, I just think it's really interesting that we, we who have been born, I speak for my generation, I'm, I'm only 30. And so if I'm born into this generation where we haven't experienced all of this, then I wonder, or we've had it so good, then it comes to a point where it's like, okay, let's trust the authorities. Let's trust who we, because they have our best interests at heart. Uh, and then unless we, unless we really oh, yeah. ask the deeper questions. Yeah, it's a huge mistake. That's why, you know, some of the, with the Romanians, since the Romanians and Bulgarians had to put up with both communism, Stalinism, and the Nazis. So that they've had it both ways. But one of the great, you know, the two act plays that was ever written on tyranny, and it, and it is, it wasn't about communism, but it's also true for fascism, since they're both, like was uh, Rhinoceros, which I'm, if, you, if you know, as a, a Romanian, uh, it was a Ceausescu, it, was, it, was, it sounds like Ceausescu, it's hard for me to pronounce it, but I have friends who are all, you know, my age that are artists who went through all that and, and in Hungary. Uh, and they're terrified because they say, what is happening? Uh, you know, be ready because, you know, the Marxists are coming in and wherever you have Marxists, it's always followed. They're usually Marxists first. Well, and then there's a reaction, which is the, the which is the, 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 the fascists, which are the same people but going the other way, and and they they they're both totalitarian. They both you know they both hate communism. They're almost identical, but the uh, yeah, there's a short play called Rhinoceros, and there's some of the of how it happens imperceptibly, you know, because the rhinoceros starts running through the center of this small Romanian town, or it could be a Hungarian town, it could be a Bulgarian. It keeps running through, and it's because of what just happened. What was that? And you can see it happen drip by drip, you know, like an anesthetic. Uh, and so until they got you and they, they there are really days, but they're not on the left and the right. They're on both. It's or and or any sort of 
any any group that wants to lord it over and who are pissed off the real pissed off ones getting even those are the sociopaths but the ones with this great passionate sort of i'm going to do this they're going to get more psychopaths in there because they had this grand vision uh, at least the sociopaths are just trying to make you miserable to get even for some perceived thing with the psychopaths a lot of them have this grand vision of purifying the world and all that it's pretty so right now it is about as dangerous as it's been since that warm summer in 1914. I wonder whether you have any time to uh, expand on and going back to something you mentioned a little bit earlier around the temporal lobe and the different experiences that didn't quite make it to your book. Do you think you have some time to, to expand on that one? Well, for one little piece, for one little piece, which is non-controversial, which has to do with empathy, because you know there is for every function, every trait, uh, and, and there is what we call now a connectome. It just means the brain connections. And there are nodes. There are, there are nodes that are very much involved in organizing these functions. The center of that node, one of those main centers for empathy is the anterior insula. It's right over here. You know, if you go right in here. And that is, that forms the border. It's, it's, it's insula. So it's insulated. It's folded inside so you can't see it. If you look at the surface of a real brain, it's hidden. It's, so the insula is a hidden thing, but it's where the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, and even part of the parietal lobe come together more posterior. But this anterior part, um, you know, is, is the area that if you, there, there are two centers there, one center, if you have that, it's more associated with emotional empathy, whereas the one next door and those connections have to do with cognitive empathy. And so that's one axis of empathy. So if an axis like this, on one end of this barbell or arrow is the emotional empathy, and the other end is cognitive. And then you have another axis, the orthogonal, a cross angle to it. In that case, you have in group empathy and out group empathy. Okay. And mm. there's so you can have, you know, any mix of these if you put it into a two by two matrix, right? Uh, people are broken down further, but what's the point? I, I like to. I like this much breaking down, and, and especially when you're trying to teach it or explain it, and it's enough to me. So, so if you look at somebody, most people, the average person would say empathy. They think it's one thing, which is that warm, fuzzy thing. You cry, I cry. You're happy, I am. I'm happy. It's the thing you want in a parent, at least one parent. Uh, it's the thing you want in a best friend. You cry together. You mirror each other's emotions, and and that's emotional empathy. But there's another kind of empathy where the person understands what you're going through but they don't feel it they're not going to cry with you it turns out after you know working with these different fundraising groups that are involved in heavily illimacinary foundations it turns out that the people that give the most of the people not with this warm fuzzy cry on your shoulder stuff the people really do things to the ones of cognitive empathy so that you hear you know a gruesome story and you'll have people crying and there'll be somebody there with 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 dry eyes. And that's the person who will go, I understand what you knew, need. And that's the person that's going to help you. Mm -hmm. So it's a, one of these quirks. Uh, it, it's just like uh, other things we were talking about at the beginning about, you know, politicians. Don't you want somebody who's sweet and nice? No, I don't, I don't want a sweet and nice, but I don't want the, 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 the leader of a country being just sweet and nice. And I don't, I don't want my neurosurgeon to be sweet and nice and breaking down every time he, you know, she, she makes the wrong cut, <laughs> you know, what the hell? And so, but people, it's a mistake people make. But in the case of the empathy, the people who are, seem to be the coldest are often the ones that give the most money, give the most time to solving other people's problems. So it's one of these things, and, and there's a different thing for, there's, it's, it's coded for differently and there's different genes. The different gene forms behind these two are different. But it turns out that people with autism and people with psychopathy are opposite. So the 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 the, the people with psychopath the psychopaths have cognitive empathy. So they may do things. In fact, they may do good things. Otherwise, it'd be when they're not killing or raping or making people's lives miserable, they may have this other mission where they're really doing some good for the the, the you know the community or something. Like, like Dexter, almost. Like what? Like the TV show Dexter. Yeah, 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 right. That would be cognitive empathy. Although and I watched every one of those, and you can't, you can't have a, a and I work with, you know, screenwriters, 
Hollywood, but also New York and, and uh, for TV and film. And I've worked with them with the groups as, at uh, all the time because they were just trying to make, how do you make this character? And you can't make, you, it's very hard to make a character that's a true psychopath because you always have to go, well, you know, all these terrible things is cold, you know, they, but he loves his sister and he loves his, you know, he's not a psychopath. So they always ruin it. But nobody, because you can't make a good, uh, it's hard to make consistently a hero or a protagonist that has any sort of attraction, uh, like a great white shark. Even, even the great white shark seemed angry at something, you know, it, it wasn't even, even in Jaws, it wasn't a good rendition because true psychopaths are just cold as be, you know, per, the predators, in, in, interspecies predators, one human on another. So even with Dexter, in order to make him attractive, they had to break the rule. And so you can, you know, only in something like No Country for Old Men do you see a really great uh, portrayal of a true psychopath. That was, you know, that was masterful. But, and I work with, you know, people who write uh, uh, crime shows and, and this is a thing that's hard to do because as soon as you, you try to make them attractive in some way, you have to have a center of good. And what's the center of good? Well, you, you get monsters like in the Godfather series. You get all these people killing and maiming, just cold-hearted. But in order to make it go and to be, keep people with it, there had to be some center of good that everybody could get around. Well, it's a family. See, they love their family. And that, and so, but a real psychopath, you know, really, really wouldn't have that kind of, yeah, so they're, they're just sociopaths, not psychopaths for the, for the mafia like that, uh, you know, in the, that, the Godfather series, but and, and so okay, so that's one type. The other type is in-group and out-group empathy. There's less known about it in terms of the genetics. There are some alleles that are more associated with it, but it's the type of person who goes into the to the election box, the voting box, and every choice they make has to do with voting for things purely for them and their family. Whatever gets more money in my pocket, they don't care about the country. They don't care about society. They that's they're in group, severe in group, and uh, and of course there's a lot of people who do that. It's, I don't care what your politics are. I don't care what your communists. You put another fifty bucks in my pocket. I'm voting for you. You can see how this can blow up in a society if everybody's like this. But then on the other end, this out group are people that truly believe in the, the in the welfare of the world. Very large groups of the world. So here is where you have this so-called, what would be the honest Marxist who really cares about all the people of the world. They don't want to control anything, but they want to share everything. And that would be like an honest, that is a, you know, that's a, that's a trait of, and it's called, it's a complete outgroup trait where people who love uh, their country, you know, that's a little bit more, that's outgroup, but it's getting a little bit less than being a green that's trying to save the world with Gaia. You know, the Gaia people, that kind of, the greens, who honestly want to help the world, right? It's there's no political motivation, but yeah, they're like that. That's the way they're wired. Um, and then there, you know, there's, then there's nationalism. It's a little smaller, and then a group tribalism. So these are normal things, and people have associations. They're either, they're tribalistic. They're they're just their family or clan. Their extended family, so they have a clan uh, grouping. And these are all wired. You're kind of born with this, and. Um, and so that determines how people vote and how they think about all the things really that we're talking about. Because the people, they would say, well, yeah, yeah, sure, the, that, the, you know, you, you can say you're for individual freedoms, but don't we care about all the people? And so you get people like Mahatma Gandhi, who loved all the people, you know, and you get people like uh, Nelson Mandela, who's like all the people he loved. And Mother Teresa, she loved all the children in the world, but anybody who knew them personally, said, you do not want to be close to these people. You know, you heard Nelson Mandela's daughter, uh, in the, you know, when he died, the service is like, it was basically boiled down that this was a great man trying to save the world, his country, his people, and you did not want to be his daughter. Same thing with Gandhi. You want to save everybody, but you did not want to be his wife or child. And, and Mother Teresa, a prickly sort of woman, but was saving all the children. So you, it's very hard to have all of these. You know, everybody would want to be I love my family and I love the whole world. I, I cry with you, but I also understand it and outside of the cry. You know, everybody wants to be all these things. And 
Sorry, folks, it doesn't happen. And you're stuck being one sort of prick or another, you know, it's like, it, 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 it's just, it's a natural thing and accept it. And so there are, you know, people who truly want to save the world. And that's the type of, that's out empathy all the way. You see, it just reminds me of that biblical um, adage yeah, to be all things to all people so that you can win some of them to your cause of God or whatever it is that you're, you're thinking about. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, but it's, it, you know, it takes the romance out of it. People know, like, you know, you seem to be extremely well read and are quite aware. Uh, but if you, you, once you take the, the po po poetry and joy and romance out of these concepts and put them into genes and connectomes, it bumps people out. It takes the magic out of life for them. To, of course, to a scientist, like, you know, if you're a scientist, this only brightens it up and makes it more interesting and wonderful. But again, that's, and that's, 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 a conversation for another day. Yeah, it just re reminds me of what you said earlier on when uh, you were invited to the TED Talk. It's you, you were really excited about stem cell research and kind of talking about that. You know, and I tell us a story. And I guess I work with stories every day. I, I love reading, I love writing, I love engaging with people, I love, love hearing your story, and I love kind of working with that. I guess this is what, what invigorates, uh, you know, it's a common human cause and interest to, to be storytellers uh, and I think even though I'd love to speak for hours and hours more I, you know, it's probably getting pretty late back where, where you are um, uh, or it probably isn't um, for me I couldn't no, no it's it's not late but I've got exactly 10 minutes I've got my wife my daughter my son-in-law my other our son his wife they're going to show up here Yes. coming from a party of our, our grandson's uh, 23rd birthday and they're going to be they're going to be raring to go so they're going to be here any second so i, uh, I do have to go no, I, I think that's actually a wonderful place to, to end it and i and i thank you so much for being so generous with your time uh yeah maybe we can do this again at some point in the future <laughs> be happy to emil great talking with you you too jim thank you so much and i wish you the very best moving forward